See, now the idea is you get those clouds to move a little further apart. You get more of that blue sky, and you've got yourself a gorgeous afternoon. Problem is, this afternoon in Flushing, we're not quite sure which way those clouds are moving. Some forecasters have called for the possibility of some thunder showers at some point or other today, but right now things looking fine, not only as far as the weather goes, but for the Mets, Ralph, as they take the field, trying to go three over the 500 mark. And this will be the New York Mets last game of the Colorado Rockies, and they'll be playing against this lineup for Colorado. It'll be Quentin McGrindle, make that Quentin McCracken as the leadoff batter in center field, batting second, the right fielder, John Vanderwall, batting in the third spot. The left fielder, Dante Bichette, batting fourth at first base, Andres Galarraga, batting in the fifth slot at third base, Vinny Castilla, batting in the next position, Jeff Reed, the catcher, and Jason Bates at second base with Walt Weiss playing shortstop, and on the mound, John Burke. And that is brought to you by Ford. They will be facing Armando Reynoso, who makes his 100th major league start and for the New York Mets it'll be his seventh start all these numbers brought to you by Toyota and it'll be the first time he's faced his former Colorado Rockies teammates Mets have won the last four games that Reynoso has started most recently Tuesday night here against Houston when Reynoso took a no decision in a four to three Met win he lasted six and two thirds gave up six hits and three runs but all oh, he certainly was Hoping to talk about afterwards, in addition to a win that never came for him, was the home run that he hit off of Mike Hampton, his third major league home run. So it's Reynoso to face the Rockies for the first time, and the Mets have never seen the Colorado starter, John Burke, either. But here's the defensive alignment that'll play behind Reynoso. Featuring a day off for Bernard Gilkey in left field, Husky sliding over to left, Ochoa getting in today. Todd Hundley did not start yesterday's game. He's back in the lineup. But Bernard Gilkey, only the second game he hasn't started this year, aside from the three that he missed after the death of his grandfather. So set to go here at Shea. Final game of the homestand in the four-game series. Mets winning two of the first three against Colorado after splitting with Houston. And Quinton McCracken takes a fastball outside. McCracken won for four in yesterday's game effectively playing with Ellis Burke still bothered by a groin injury. And that's inside to McCracken 2 and 0. The Kraken out of Duke University has always played well against the Mets. I mean, he's never been a regular with the Rockies, but whenever he's been in there against New York, he's done a good job batting 387 lifetime against the Mets. And there's strike one. And Ellis Burks on the bench with that sore groin. Don't forget the Rockies have a long ride to make after this game to San Francisco. Slap the other way. They'll play the Giants tomorrow night, so some of the regulars getting today off. See, that's the problem with you modern guys. <laughs> a five-hour ride is a long ride. How about when they took the trains and you had to go like two days from uh, New York to St. Louis? Now, that's a long ride. And how did you, well, let's get to this in a second, as McCracken on 2-2 lifts it foul. Now, the longest trip that you'd make between games would take, what, two days? Oh, yeah, you come out of St. Louis, and you might be going from St. Louis to Boston. It'd be a two-day, two-night trip. And you weren't a little bit loopy by the time you got to that next site? No, I'd go might, nuts. Your fingers might be a little tired from playing cards, but other <laughs> than that, it. it wasn't bad at all. Three balls. In fact, strikes. that's one of the problems with baseball today. There's not enough uh, mixing of the ball players. You used to get together in the lounge car. There'd be card games going on. Guys would be reading books. They'd be talking baseball. All that stuff would be going on now. The trips are an hour long or an hour and a half or two hours. You go cross country, it's five hours. Ordonez throws out McCracken one away. Ray Ordonez saw him in the pregame on the defensive prowess that he's exhibited lately. So let me ask you this then. All the years you traveled with the Mets doing 162 games between TV and radio, particularly after the next wave of expansion that saw Montreal and San Diego come in, I got 12 teams as opposed to the eight when you played. Which had you more tired? The train trips in the old days or all of the plane trips that you have to take now? 
I would say that the uh, the difference really is incomparable because it is a different way of living. Uh, there was more fun. There was a lot more fun to ride the trains, especially if the trips were Boston to New York or from uh, Philadelphia to New York. And uh, the shorter trips, the longer trips are a little bit tough, but uh, we were on the train a long time. But the worst part about road trips and train trips was the fact you had to take care of your own luggage. You had to get it off the train <laughs> and take it through the station and get it in a cab and take it to the hotel. Now it's all done for you. Yeah, the amazing thing, fans ought to know this. It's one and two to Vanderwall. A baseball player will pack his own luggage. That's about it. Then he calls for a bellhop. Well, how bell about hop his wife probably packed it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he doesn't even touch that stuff. Well, on the road, let's give him the benefit of the doubt. He'll pack his bag, call for a bellhop. Bellhop takes it downstairs. Next time the player sees that bag, it's in the next hotel at the next city. Lifted the left, Husky waited. And there are two away. That's evidence of a different world right there. So two out, nobody 10. on, and Dante Bichette will Dante be the batter. Bichette. But the Rockies are on a two-week road trip. They're playing 13 games. They're only two and seven on the previous nine during this trip. And Don Baylor has suffered through a couple of nightmarish eight innings, not only yesterday, but in Pittsburgh last Wednesday. Again, a 12-walk performance by his pitchers. Pirates scoring nine in the eighth inning. Yeah, Mets only scored eight in the eighth inning against uh, Baylor last yesterday's ball game. So he's got one to talk about prior to that. Yeah, he'll fill up five hours with conversation on this coming trip to San Francisco, right. lamenting his pitchers. One and one to Bichette. And Bobby Jones made his major league debut yesterday for the Rockies. Bichette with a soft looper to center. Everett broke back, but now gets there, and the side retires. Slow start for Everett, but he recovers. One, two, three inning for Reynoso. And here come the Mets. New York Mets baseball on Sports Channel is brought to you in part by the employee owners of TWA. With service to over 90 destinations worldwide, Transworld Airlines, we're up to something good. No score last of the first inning on an ice cream kind of day at Shea Stadium. Shirt sleeves and ice cream and cold soda will be consumed in abundance today. And here's the Met lineup, Ralph, brought to you by GMC. Okay, Carl Everett will lead it off. He's in center. Edgardo Alfonso batting second at third. Batting third at first is John Olerud. Hotley the catcher batting fourth. Husky batting fifth. Bayerga batting in the sixth position. Ochoa batting seventh. Ordonis batting in the shortstop position and batting eighth. And uh, Reynoso, the pitcher, batting ninth. And Carl Everett takes ball one from John Burke. That's getting their first look at this 27-year-old right-hander out of Highlands Ranch, Colorado. It's his 19th big league game, but his first start. And Everett shoots one up the middle. And the Mets have a leadoff base runner. So Carl Everett, who was 0 for 3 yesterday, Number Starts with a base hit now. Is Frank Funk calling the bullpen already? Oh, he's in trouble if he is. <laughs> he but no one throwing. Yeah, he of little faith after yesterday. But John Burke overcame what is commonly known nowadays as the Steve Blass disease. Former Pittsburgh Pirate pitcher Steve Blass suddenly lost all sight of home plate. Was never an effective pitcher. After winning three games in the 71 World Series. Got a whole new career out of it. He ended up being a broadcaster. And a good one, too. He's been with the Pirates for a long time now. In the booth. He went from a 20-game winner to where he couldn't get the ball over the plate. That's the biggest difference I've ever seen in Major League Baseball. Outstanding pitcher, and then all of a sudden he had no control at all. Everett getting back to first. Edgardo Alfonso. Having a pretty good homestand for the Mets with six out of 17. Yeah. Everett running, and it's chopped to short. The only play for Weiss is to first, and that moves Everett to second, one away. 
So the hit and run play working for the Mets. Not exactly the way you'd like to have it work. You'd like to see a base hit, but first baseman Colorado had the right man staying in the position. They had the second baseman covering with Alfonso hitting. And the shortstop Weiss makes the play, but the Mets move the runner down to second base and have a runner in scoring position. So far this year, they have hit 310 as a team with runners in scoring position. So John Olerud, who's been right at the top of the list in the National League in that department, 538 batting average, men in scoring position. And he's hit by the pitch. So the first pitch from Burke looked like an off-speed pitch, a breaking ball of some sort. Well, Don Bader now, that's one thing he didn't see in yesterday's ball game. Nobody was hit by a pitch in that wild eighth inning where they had five walks. So a new way to get a runner on base. And the Rockies defensively brought to you by the new Dodge. Vanderwall getting a rare start in right field. Bates for Young at second. And again, Ellis Burks out with a groin injury. So McCracken, the starting center fielder. So it's set up now for Todd Hundley with runners at first and second and one out. And he takes a strike from Burke. Hundley pinch hit yesterday, only the fifth game yesterday afternoon that he did not start, or has not started behind the plate. Alberto Castillo picking him up yesterday, but Todd got into the ball game anyway. And now Everett's running, and Hundley fouls it off. Certainly looked like Everett took off on his own there. Well, that's that's really a dangerous play by Carl Everett. You got your big man at the plate, one man out, and he's running with the pitch. It was fouled off. He gets thrown out trying to get third base on the steal. The Mets really get taken out of the inning. He was going on his own, obviously. Behind him, Olerud did not make a break for second. Well, that's a dangerous play. Unfortunately, he did not get thrown out. Inside the Hundley, one and two. The other thing that makes the play even more difficult to pull off is the fact that you got a left hand batter up there and the catcher has a clean throw in the third base. Stealing third base with a left hand batter at the plate is very difficult to do. In the dirt, nice stop by Reed. Two and two to Hundley. You got Hundley up there with 10 home runs and 34 runs batted in. He's been awfully hot against Colorado. This year he's hitting 347 against Colorado. He had that 10 on base in 10 at bats against Colorado. I mean, all the things would keep you from dealing on the play going to third here in this spot. Outfield shaded towards right. Everett at second, Olerud at first. And now the count full to Hundley. And Butch Husky has been a hot hitter lately on deck. Of course, the one thing right here, you could have your runners in motion with a count of three balls and two strikes. It takes a lot of discipline for the hitter not to swing at a bad pitch if they are going. Sort of in the back of your mind, you think you have to protect the runners, but you don't. But there's always that thought there. And the deep by Burke sends Everett back to second. Last of the first with no score, and the Mets with a threat. Let's see if they're moving on the payoff pitch to Hundley. They are. And it's hit deep to right field, straight down the line. And in fair territory, it's hauled in by Vanderwall. Everett tags and goes to third. Olerud hangs on at first. Well, Hundley just missed a three-run home run there as he tired that ball out to right field. Everett had time to go all the way on the run to third and then come all the way back to second and then go all the way back to third. That ball was up there for a long time. It's a 3-2 fastball. And he just missed hitting that ball out of the ballpark. The runners were going on the play with a 3-2 count. It runs <laughs> 270 feet. <laughs> That's pretty to get good. Get over workout. to third. Yeah. <laughs> Hundley thought he had that one. He thought at least it was going to be against the fence. And a fastball for a strike to Butch Husky. 
Over his last 10 games, he's batting 400 with four homers and eight RBIs. That 275 batting average looks mighty good when you consider that less than two full weeks ago it was down at 228. Towards right center. Vanderwall. And the side retired. So the Mets threatened to get nothing except the hit and leave two into the end of one. The Mets and the Rockies, no score. May 31st is Sharp Electronics Cap Night. All fans 15 and over receive the Mets' new white game cap free. So call for seats and join us as the Mets take on the Phillies. Call 718-507-TIXX and get your Mets now. All right, time for the Sports Channel WCBS-FM Trivia Quiz. If you know the answer, tune in to WCBS-FM 101.1 tomorrow morning at 7.45 for the Phil Pepe Sports Report on the Harry Harrison Show. You could win a family four-pack of tickets to an upcoming Mets home game. Andres Galarraga swings at a Reynoso slider to start the second. Galarraga, Castilla, and Jeff Reed to face Armando Reynoso. Yeah, that's a fast ball for a strike. Nothing in two. Galarraga with that unusual batting stance. Had three hits in the series so far, and two of them have been monstrous home runs. Recently passed Tony Armas as the all-time home run leader out of Venezuela. Now he's just two RBIs away from tying Dave Concepcion for the top RBI total among native Venezuelans. Nine hundred forty eight career runs batted in. And the two two from Reynoso towards right. Ochoa coming and he's got it. And a circle around that one is Alex Ochoa just gets there in time. One out in the second. Vinny Castilla will be next. Well, the pitch right here jams Galarraga. He gets it in on the trademark part of the bat. Wasn't hit as hard as Ochoa thought at the beginning. He finally gets it in gear and gets up under it. Makes a slide in for a nice catch. Oh, Reynoso has retired the first four. Now it's Vinny Castilla. Took Ricky Trulicek deep yesterday. This has been a month that Vinny would like to forget so far, despite what looked like uh, pretty good numbers. Only nine out of 55 during the month of May. And Ordonius tested here. Two out. 05 in a row for Next Armando six, Reynoso. Catcher Jeff Reed. Painted the Muth with the balls and strike calls today. Gary Darling, C.B. Buckner, and Charlie Relliford. The rest of the umpiring crew. That's a change from the first three games of this series. Umpires, when they go from the weekend into the start of the next week of Monday, have been changing their rotations and changing their different locations. So the catcher, Jeff Reed, looks at a pitch under the knees from Reynoso. Reed's had a pretty good offensive start to this season, backing up Kurt Manwaring. It's off the inside corner, 2-0, and, oh, and he's also thrown the ball very well. Reed having his best defensive season behind the plate. Lifetime 242 hitter coming into this year. That's do uh, down low. Three balls, no strikes. Lifetime time against the Mets. He's hit only 190. He's had one home run against the Mets. Up high, ball four, and Reynoso issues his first walk of the afternoon. 
And Reed is on at first base. Last year he had a stolen base against the Mets. It was his first stolen base and 555 at bats. Gave him a total of three for the year. He's had four career stolen bases. So you can say things like so and so runs well for a catcher <laughs> or a catcher. That would definitely give you a chance to say that. He's in that category. And the good thing when you're on base against Armando Reynoso is that you've got to be especially careful. Well, Jason Bates drives this one to straightaway center. Everett thinks he's got room, and he does. Everett making sure he knew where he was in proximity to the wall, and he grabs the long fly ball off the bat of Jason Bates. So at the end of an inning and a half, no score. Mets fans, catch your favorite players on Mets Inside Pitch with in-depth features, reports, and interviews. Mets Inside Pitch, Fridays at 5.30 on Sports Channel. I'm not aware of this being any kind of holiday, but there are a lot of kids in the ballpark this afternoon for a Monday afternoon. Well, they might have all played hooky. I can relate. Some of them, of course, too young to be concerned with being in school, such as the guy with that big blue bat. There must be something going on. Awful lot of kids here at the ball game today between the Mets and the Colorado Rockies. And Carlos Baerga's had a bat working about as big as those souvenir jobs. At least it must seem that way to Carlos, who has really come alive over his last 16 games. He's batting at 410, and so the average now up to a more than respectable 285. Bayerga had two hits in that eighth inning uprising yesterday. He's done something nobody has ever done in a big inning. He batted twice and hit a home run left-handed and a home run right-handed. He was with Cleveland. One hopper to Galarraga, one man out on the second. Well, the Mets involved Ralph is a pretty good defensive work in the outfield during the Rockies half of the second. The Mets have really had a good job defensively from their team. 982 percentage. They're number three in the league. Here's one of those outstanding plays. Ochoa coming in to make that play. Everett going back, and he's feeling for the fence, but he doesn't make contact with the fence. He's in front of it by about two or three steps. He's got that hand out there. He's not sure whether that fence was. Ochoa drops a pretty good bunt, but a better play by the pitcher Burke to throw him out. Good reaction by the right-hander John Burke to get Ochoa at first two away. Number zero, shortstop Ray Ordonez. Well, a bunt here in this situation with one out is sort of a give up. I mean, you got the eighth place hitter and the pitcher coming up. You really want to get an extra base hit here if you can. You certainly can't do it with a bunt and he's throwing out. The position in the batting order determines whether or not it's a good play or not. And also the score has a lot to do with it. The score is even, but kind of questionable about why you would attempt to bunt there. Ray Ordonius has not been hitting, just two hits on this home stand. And he hits that one in the air to center field McCracken makes the catch and the side retired so the Mets go in order five in a row now retired by Burke and at the end of two we're scoreless is the bank in my neighborhood going to close where did all those fees come from you may have some questions about all the recent big bank mega mergers who am I going to bank with now maybe it's time to bank at home federal checking fees ATM fees, Christmas club fees. Our mortgage rates are low. Our classic checking is the best deal in town, and we'll never leave you out in left field. Hello? Home Federal. You don't have to go far to get far. That's fun to do. You get to get in the pitcher's mind a little bit. I kind of enjoy just getting on first base and being able to do that when you want to. It cause a lot of havoc out there, so that's my job. Well, that's how Mr. Wilson from Home Improvement got his start. <laughs> that omnipresent next door neighbor, huh? That's it. Oh, aren't they a picnic? Can't go two feet without somebody peering over the fence at you. But Spy Cam 
Nailed it. Brought to you by Chase. Our Kim was looking especially that youngster and his dad. So here's Walt Weiss leading off the third for the Rockies. And a fastball for a strike. Bottom of the order, Weiss, Burke, and then back to the top and McCracken for Colorado against Armando Reynoso here in the third. That's trying to end this homestand on a positive. They've won six of their last eight overall, 14 of their last 20, and 18 of their last 28. Two and one to Weiss. These two teams uh, contrast because Colorado started their season 21 and nine, the best they've ever done. And the Mets got off to a very slow start, winning only three of their first 12. Sounded like he broke his bat. Bayerga throws out Weiss. So one out here in the third, and Bayerga can relate to that sound. He broke close to 20 earlier in the year. Adding nine, number 37. Part of it in the left hand, the rest of it in the right. You ever lose any sleep at night because you broke your gamer and maybe it hit five or six home runs with it in 10 days or two weeks? Never lost any sleep, but I sure could get mad at uh, the situation because when you get one of those bats that has really good wood and that's really hard, you want to keep it forever. John Burke. Well, when, go ahead. Pardon no, me, I was Ron. saying 0 and 1 on John Burke. Now, they, uh, you order your bats and you tell them exactly what you want, the model you want. I used uh, the same model most of my career and uh, you tell them how heavy you want it to be and they come out and uh, they come out just to your specifications. So the only difference would be the grain in the bat and how hard the wood is. Little looper over towards the left field line and Husky got a glove on it. A foul ball and a good try by Butch Husky. Got to cover a lot of ground. That railing was starting to feel like Kurt Manwaring. Oh, he ran into Manwaring earlier, so he's had some pretty good contact here in the last four ball games. Now, over here, that that ground over there is very abrasive, and you can really get yourself cut up on these kind of plays as he slides on that hard ground. Ball boy right there involved in everything. That could be a thankless job. Suddenly you're in the middle of the action and you're not supposed to be. Inside the Burke one and two. So I guess you'd become something of an expert on various types of wood if you had to order bats to very, very precise specification, huh? Absolutely. You really want them to be the same. And of course, that does make a difference. It's almost like a violin. <laughs> Take your business partner back with you to the bench. You don't want anybody using the bat that you're using that you picked out Center for Hinder, what they call a gamer. I used the G69L, which was a bat actually designed by Louisville for uh, Gene Woodling. And one day when Woodling was with the Pittsburgh Pirates, I picked up his bat and I liked the feel of it. It had a big handle and a very heavy big barrel. Only Woodling did not use a bat as heavy as the one I used, but uh, they're very, they come out very specifically designed. And one thing you really look for in a bat is knots in the hitting surface. That means that the growth on the tree that is cut from evidently had an injury of some kind and it grew a protection around the grain that made a knot in the bat. 1 0 oh on McCracken. I know so striking out Burke for his first strikeout of the afternoon. The Rockies with no hits. Two out here in the third. Mets no runs on one hit. Whitten McCracken mentioned going to Duke University, and he got out the hard way, too. He did it the way you're supposed to, ideally, in four years. And he wasn't one of these health ed majors just kind of drifting through some gift courses. This guy majored in poli sci and history. He wanted to get married in the chapel of Duke University, and he had to make a reservation that was going to be three years. He knew he was getting out in four. Pretty good job by McCracken. 
There is a type of grain that you see in a bat. That's fairly white grain. I'd like my grain even wider apart, maybe a quarter of an inch if you could do it. Don't get many of them that are really perfect. Second walk issued by Reynoso. McCracken aboard with two out. John Vanderwall will right be next. Fielder, Never down Vanderwall. in Louisville, Kentucky. Go to the Louisville Slugger. It's now a uh, place for uh, they, where they have all kinds of uh, tours through there. And it's really worth it to see how bats are made. They're cut out of a big square block of wood and rounded off. And it's really an experience to take a look and see that. And Reynoso does it again. Or, well, let's see the first base sump. Gary Darling called him out. But there may be a, is there a ball? Maybe the or was ball there a timeout right. call? Time was called. Uh, Gary Darling, the first base umpire, punched McCracken out. The second base ump, C.B. Buckner, interceded, I believe, and said timeout was being called. So Reynoso, there's the second base ump, Buckner. Reynoso losing his third pickoff of the year. Well, the way he picks runners off, he still may get them. Since 1993, he's picked off 30 runners. That's the most in the major leagues. He's got the quickest feet in town. Look at how fast those feet move. The time had been called. The home plate umpire evidently had given time to the hitter. And so no play. Still 1-0 and on Vanderwall. Reynoso this year has picked off Bob Abreu of the Astros, Wilton Guerrero of the Dodgers. In the hole, Ordonius covers the ground, long throw, put a circle around that one. Ray Ordonius does it again. Middle of the third, no score. Well, it's always good to have a 400 hitter around in the lineup, and that's what Armando Reynoso will be when he gets to the plate, but he also has help from his shortstop. And this is the play that Ordonez makes to end the inning. He's had a great series against Colorado. So in this case, the man who makes the great play to end the inning will be up ninth. <laughs> See, it doesn't always work. Reynoso with a rip, and he's got himself another base hit. Dante Bichette plays it back in, and Armando Reynoso, five out of 11 this year, including a home run. Center fielder, Carl Everett. All right, Reynoso, Wednesday night, gets a lot of wood on this one and hits it out of the ballpark, his third career home run, his first this year. And this time at bat, as he leads off the inning in the third, he breaks the bat and gets a base hit to left field. Second hit for the Mets. Second time they've had the leadoff man on. And now we'll go back to the top and Carl Everett, who's single to start the first. Yes, now with his fifth hit. Castillo is on the grass at third, and Everett made it look like he was going that way. One to zero. Probably the warmest afternoon we've had so far this season at Shea Stadium. Very little breeze to speak of. Going out from left rather gently right about now. I can't read that. I need one of those digitals. It looks like it's around 80, but Everett hits it in the air to right field. Drifting back is Vanderwall. I know so it played it halfway, so he'll go back to first. One man out. And Carl just missing a home run right there. He just got a shade underneath it. It was high enough. Cut a little off the top and added to the length and then had a home run. It's the fastball. Gets it just underneath it. He thought he might have had it, but it didn't carry. So he goes back to the bench. And Alfonso with an enjoyable weekend against Colorado. He pops the ball up, though. It's the catcher, Jeff Reed. Now there are two out. So after the pitcher Reynoso singled, Everett First flies to right. Now Alfonso Olerud. fouls out. It'll be up to Olerud now. <laughs> the 
you know so five out of eleven as a hitter he'd only been a 140 career batter coming into this year. He's done everything else maybe he'll try and steal second now for older with those quick feet he might be able to do that. 30 base runners right. in the last three and a half years have found out about those quick feet of Reynoso. Olerud was hit by a pitch in the first inning. Also took yesterday off. Walked as a pinch hitter. And now he lines one towards the gap. Cut off by McCracken. That'll hold Reynoso at second. And the Mets have their third hit, a clean single by John Olerud. Olerud with that very short stroke does it again. His third hit in the series. He's three for nine in the series. Look how short that swing is. He gets the bat right to the ball and lines it into left center field. Good job in the outfield by McCracken to hold that to a single. Got a good jump in the ball. Now it's in Todd Huntley's hand. But well, Todd's had a lot of angry at bats lately, hasn't he, Ralph? Falls he's just gotten under and just take. missed a home run his last time up. Just a shade underneath it. Caught right in the corner. Out in right field. Out in front, nothing in one. I mean, Todd's taken some steam back to the dugout with him in the last week. Balls that he's just missed getting under. You know, the batting average at 280, 10 homers, 34 RBIs. John Burke in his first major league start in his 19th appearance. Nothing in two. Oh, that's a fight. He got that ball inside just off the plate. They've been trying to pitch Todd in there just off the plate on the inside. And they figure that he'll pull that ball foul. He might hit it hard, but it would be a foul ball. He hadn't had a home run since his unbelievable series in Colorado. Reynoso at second, Olerud at first, two out, and an 0-2 to Huntley. And that's it in the air to right field, right center. McCracken way over in the gap, and the side retires. So the Mets get two hits, but they leave them both. Fran Healy's coming up next. Still no score. Top of the fourth inning, the scoreless ball game, the Mets against Colorado in the final game of this homestand for the New York Mets. Umpire is having a three-way conversation right there and discussing glasses. There was a time in baseball where umpires wouldn't wear glasses on the field. You'd see them in the hotel lobbies with glasses on reading the paper, but never see an umpire with glasses on the field. And here's a man who has just gone to glasses so he can see his scorecard. <laughs> Fran Healy coming in for the play-by-play. -play. All right, Ralph. And by the way, Sports Channel and GHI salute Nicholas Marino of Albany, New York, the GHI health insurance broker of the day. Contact the GHI broker for all your health insurance needs. Speaking of glasses, even baseball players, I think scouts years ago sh uh, shied away from baseball players because of they would see somebody with glasses. I think there's only one guy, well, he stood out in everybody's mind who led the league in hitting who wore glasses from day one. Was it Hafey? Chick Hafey. Also, there was a shortstop for the St. Louis Cardinals, the first man to wear glasses in the infield. Specs, obviously, for Porsche. <laughs> Shortstop. That was my manager in minor league baseball. Specs to Porsche. And back to Bichette. Bunts over a good breaking ball from Aranda Reynosa, and it's a strike on Bichette. Bichette in his ball game, one at bat. Fly to center field, so he's hold for one. Beautiful day here at Chase Stadium. Final game of this homestand. The Mets head for Miami, Florida. Open up a two-game series tomorrow night against the Marlins. Sports Channel bring you all the action from the state of Florida. As the shed takes down and in. One ball and one strike. Of course, today players were contacts. Remember Yogi Berra wore glasses, and that was a big deal for a catcher. One and one fouled off. Well, speaking of Yogi Berra, Ralph, been a lot of talk since Larry Bird got the job in Indiana, Indiana with the Pacers about 
great players who made great managers. How about Yogi Berra? Great manager. Championship manager. Yeah, won the championship in the American League and also in the National League. And a Hall of Fame player as the Chet swings and misses. One down. Good slider there by Reynoso to pick up his second First strikeout in this ballgame. The Shet thinking fastball and then ball sliding away and that's how it got its name. It's supposed to slide away at the last minute. The better the slider the less it breaks and the faster it breaks. In the batter now Andres Galarraga he flied out his first time up. There is a strike to Galarraga. Solid major league player. Swings over the breaking ball. Owen Bill. Armando Reynosa pitching against his friends. He was a very popular player with the Colorado Rockies. He's something if he threw a no hitter against his former mates and became the first Met to do it. The rest of the game, he's got one. Two down. Third baseman, Vinny Castillo. Right here, you look at the pitch perfectly placed on that outside corner, and Galarraga goes right over the top of it. Another very good slider. Stats so far as he takes on Vinny Castilla. Castilla, 0 for 1 in his game. He grounded out and he swings through a breaking ball. So it's 0 and 1 on the Rocky third baseman. Castilla, notorious first ball hitter. He hit 21 home runs last year off his first pitch and batted 416. There's a breaking ball that misses down low, 1 and 1. He is considered a real good fastball hitter on this Rocky ball club. Probably hurt Dante Bichette and his other teammates the past couple of years because never considered a home run hitter until he joined the Rockies outside. Two and one. I got to believe, Ralph, that the first person to win a most valuable player award with the Rockies will be a pitcher if he wins 20 games. Not a hitter. You go right in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> That's right. Another breaking ball. Strike two balls, two strikes on Vinny Castilla. Two men are out. There was Rich won 17 ball games for the Rockies last year, but you got to win 20 to win the MVP. But Seaver won 19. We got the, the uh, Cy Young Award. Mm -hmm. There's a high fly ball center field. Carl Everett looking around the sun. Now he turns and makes the grab, and that'll do it for the Rockies here in the fourth. Reynoso is the story. No score. The Rockies and the Mets as we go to the bottom of the fourth. New York Mets baseball on Sports Channel is brought to you in part by Bud Light. If you want great taste that won't fill you up and never lets you down, make it a Bud Light. Sunday, June 1st is Con's Kids Jersey Day. Free for everyone 14 and under. So call for seats and join us as the Mets take on the Phillies. Call 718-507-TIXX and get your Mets now. John Franco, number 31, with a great career behind him and still more ahead. And Paul Wilson looking for a great career, still on the DL with the New York Mets because of the arm operation. Paul Wilson will be featured tomorrow night by Sports Channel. Inside the game on the pregame show, Paul Wilson ahead of schedule. Bob Apodaca told me, very impressed at the way this guy works. He's, he's worked extremely hard. He's lost weight, lost body fat. Maybe, maybe his broadcast boost should come into something like that. Losing that body fat. And here's Butch Husky. The ball hard, base hit in the left field. Well, Husky continues his strong hitting. And now there's a break in the action with Husky on at first base. Ought to be a great time for the great taste of Bud Light. It's a big hit with fans everywhere because it won't fill you up and never let you down. So why don't you make it a Bud Light? 
And Cookie Ross occasionally have a Bud Light. He's flashing signs now to Carlos Baerga and Butch Husky on first base. How about Baerga turning it around? Last 16 games hitting 4-10, raising his average 124 points. Now starting to drive in runs. With that confidence will come that power again. He takes outside 1-0. He has yet to hit a home run, but he got off to such a poor start, he was just concerned about staying in the lineup. He was just hoping to chip away and get a hit here and get a hit there. He actually didn't stay in the lineup. They benched him. Alexander taking over at second base, and he was very unhappy about that, and I don't blame him. I don't either. You just don't get a grace period anymore, do you? He hits a high fly ball to deep left field. Bichette makes the grab in front of the warning track. One down. Remember years ago, Ralph, a guy could struggle and struggle for two, three months, and then all of a sudden turn his year around and end up in the, having a decent right season. Fielder, Today, Alex you don't Ochoa. have the luxury of struggling for two or three months. You're out of the lineup. And I don't care who you are. You take Babe Ruth out of the lineup? Today they would. No way. Today they take him up. They wouldn't give him that great spirit of struggling. Listen, for Babe Ruth took his manager and hung him out over the back of a train over the railroad tracks. You know, you got to reconsider that. <laughs> <laughs> so I wouldn't take him out of the lineup. I'd say, Babe, you can make out the lineup. <laughs> Miller Huggins, he took him right to the back end of the train and hung him out over the railroad tracks. There goes Husky to throw to second. Not in time. So Butch Husky stealing second base. And that's Husky's first steal of the year. He had been thrown out once before. And he surprises everybody by taking off on this fastball. It was not a hit and run play. Ochoa taking the pitch without trying to protect him. And Husky gets the stolen base. The Mets 37th of the year. Good call. So 1-0 on Alex Ochoa, who's 0 for 1. No score here at Chase Stadium and a breaking ball from Burke misses outside 2-0. How oh, about this right-hander John Burke has struggled with his control. Although he overcame a problem about a year and a half ago, could not throw the ball over the plate. The Rockies are very high on him. Joe fouls it off, so it's 2-1. And he got into the starting rotation, replacing Jamie Wright, who went on the DL. You know, you were talking about Bayerga. He uh, was sitting in the dugout. Manny Alexander was hurt. Sterling Hitchcock was the pitcher. Bayerga had been about two for 23 against Hitchcock. Ended up with two hits that night. Swung on a miss, two and two. It's amazing what turns it around. After that, he started getting his hits, talking about Carlos Baerga, and became more relaxed at the plate. Alex Ochoa is still trying to get it going. He's batting 195. Up. Funny when you're hitting 195, nothing feels comfortable. Ocho has really been struggling his last home run back in 96, September 10th. Oh, and the ball is bound. There goes Husky. They got him. Late start. Late break off second base, and they threw him out by a country mile. He got that ball and got it to third base, threw a strike. That was it for Butch Husky. This will not be an attempted steal because the ball was in the dirt, a wild pitch, but Reed recovered so quickly. Rusky didn't go, Rusky didn't go right away, and he's out at third base. Good pickup of that throw by Castilla. So the Mets lose a base runner. So two men are out. We're in the bottom of the fourth inning, no score. The Rockies and the Mets on a beautiful afternoon here at Shea Stadium. Line drive snagged by the first baseman, Andres Galarraga, and that'll do it for the Mets. They fail to score. We played for, and there is no score. Well, folks, this copyrighted telecast is authorized under television rights granted by the New York Mets solely for the private non-commercial use of our audience. Any publication, reproduction, retransmission, or other use of the pictures, descriptions, and accounts of this game without the express written consent of the New York Mets and Sports Channel is prohibited.
gentleman right there is keeping score and catching up on Shakespeare. Reading him. As the catcher, Jeff Reed, steps in. 0 and 1 on Jeff Reed. Zeros across the board. The Rockies. Mondo Reynoso's last team. Fouled off. 0 and 2 on Jeff Reed. He's been making perfect pitches throughout this ballgame. Well, we got a second. Our congratulations to Stephen and Maria. Had a baby girl. Brianna Mealy, seven pounds, eight ounces. Mr. Mealy here, a special policeman at Shea Stadium grandfather. Yeah, talking to him. That's the second great grandchild. There's a bouncer right back to Reynoso. One down here in the top of the fifth inning. Second this is about the Jason time of game Bates. if a pitcher has no hitter, he starts thinking about it himself, Ralph. Yeah, about now it kicks in. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, they still go through the uh, pretense of not talking about it on the bench, but uh, sort of been an old-fashioned thing. We've always figured it's not fair for our listening audience not to bring them up to date when the pitcher's working on a no-hitter so they can stay and watch. Jason Bates takes ball one from Armando Reynoso. Ryan, you caught what? Two no hitters? Caught two no hitters, yes. Steve Busby threw both no hitters. Well, they had to be great pitchers because you were calling for the pitches. That's huh? exactly right. He had to be a great pitcher. Boy. Tell you a funny story mm -hmm. that happened here, Ralph, if you talk about superstitions. It happened right here at Chase Stadium. The Yankees were playing the Royals. 2 0 right now on Jason Bates. Takes inside 3 0. Doc Metz, remember the big right hander? Sure do. Had a no hitter going in the ninth inning. Great. Offer incidentally. Mm -hmm. And the Royals went up to, to hit, and the hitter was swinging the bat, waiting for Doc Medic to get his warm up tosses done. Here's a 3 0 pitch. There's a strike 3 and 1 on Jason Bates. And Thurman Munson turned to the hitter and said, This guy's going to throw a no hitter. What do you immediately think of? He just jinxed him. <laughs> and sure enough, base hit in the ninth inning, broke up the no hitter right after that statement. Here's a 3 1 pitch. Ball four. Well, Alan Bennis had a shot at a no-hitter earlier against the Atlanta Braves. He had Short two outs in the ninth and lost right. it. And that was last Friday night. It is funny how superstitious players get. But you always said, Ralph, you've been a professional for 40-some odd years. Don't be afraid of telling the truth. Can't go wrong there, can you? <laughs> did you say that? Or no, I, just I put didn't those say that. In your mouth? <laughs> but I'll take credit. <laughs> I like that. That doesn't hurt my reputation. <laughs> Bates leading off first. The batter, Walt Weiss. Up high. 1-0 on Walt Weiss. On the out to talk to Reno. So did you ever break up a no-hitter route? Yeah, a couple of them. One time I had uh, a home run off Bubba Church. Uh, that was the only hit of the ball game. I had two hits off Newcomb one time, and they were the only two hits of the game. I participated in a few on the other end. <laughs> <laughs> One and oh on Walt Weiss. Now, oh, there's a strike. One ball and one strike. Who was the one who no hit you? What pitcher? Would we know him? No, I don't remember exactly. Uh, there were a few I played in that were they know it our team. I was happy to be in one Nolan Ryan threw against Kansas City. You contributed Absolutely. all for four? Uh, yes. And I was uh, you gotta be proud when you're involved in a no-hitter. You have put a lot of pitchers in the Hall of Fame. I certainly did. Here's the one-one pitch. Oh, no. Foul. I had a home run off a pitcher one day, and the next day. He flew to the West Coast and went on a disabled list and was out for like two months right after the home run. <laughs> they didn't know what was wrong with him, but they figured there must be something. <laughs> I, I get a kick out of it. One and two now on Walt Weiss. 
Tom Seaver's hard to believe he did not throw a no-hitter with the Mets. Pitch five one-hitters with the Mets, and he lost one no-hitter with one out in the ninth inning. Jimmy Qualls got a base hit on him. Well, White just struck out. You know, they talk about that Jimmy Qualls, but Seaver had a no-hitter with two out in the ninth inning against the Cubs. And Tarzana Wallace got a base hit. That's the closest Seaver ever got until he got a no-hitter for Cincinnati. Here's the last strikeout. Wall Weiss, the batter, and a good curveball right there. And the pitcher now, John Burke, is the batter. He's 0 for 1. He struck on the third. Swings and misses. 0 and 1. We're in the top of the fifth inning here at Shea Stadium. No score, the Rockies and the Mets. Four hits in this game for the Mets. No hits for the Rockies. Of course, a great no-hitter was pitched here by Jim Bunning against the Mets. A perfect game. 1964 on Father's Day. I remember, it was the first game of a doubleheader. Philadelphia against the Mets, and uh, we did an interview. I did the interview, as a matter of fact, out at home plate to interview him for pitching that perfect game. He struck out John Stevenson for the final out of the ball game. And when I was doing the interview, a beautiful lady came running out of the stands and threw her arms around Jim Bunning. And Bob Murphy was standing up on in the broadcast booth upstairs with Lindsey Nelson. And Lindsey said to Bob, is that his wife? And Bob and Lindsey says, I certainly hope so. <laughs> Here's a one-two pitch. All off. So we're doing it again in one and two. One ball and two strikes on John Burke. Two up. Show you the difference in what has taken place in that period of time. Bunny went on the Ed Sullivan show after the ball game and got a thousand dollars. Today they wouldn't cross the street for that. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't go on the show. Not that saying Jim. I, I Any think, of the players. Well, I think Jim wouldn't have gone on the show under that circumstance if it were today. He'd want more money. He didn't even want to do the show, and that we told him it was being televised back to Philadelphia. And he finally got talked into coming on and doing that show after the perfect game by a fellow named Gallagher, who was our producer at the time. Two and two on John Burke. Two outs. Top of the fifth. No score. The Mets and the Rockets. There's a fly ball left field. Husky drifting back and making a grab for round number three. Reynoso's the story. We're through four and a half. No score. The Rockies and the Mets. And look at that hit column. scores you go to the bottom of the fifth inning here at Shea Stadium Armando Reynoso so far featuring a game in which he's allowed no Iraqi hits and here's the story Jim Bunning Ralph here's Bunning with his perfect game against the New York Mets striking out John Stevenson the catcher in the game for the Mets and being congratulated by the Philadelphia Phillies for a perfect game against the Mets in 1964 on Father's Day and there's Reynoso coming into the dugout after the last inning Pitchers start thinking about a no hitter around the fifth inning. You know, it's really amazing. There has never been a no hit, no run game pitched by Mets pitchers in a regular season game. They've had some combined no hitters in spring training. Isn't there one of the teams at the Padres in the National League down low? Yeah, but they haven't been around as long as the Mets. But Seaver pitched five one hitters for the. New York Mets down low to Ray Ordonez. It's 2 and 0 oh on the Mets shortstop. That's playing some good baseball. There's the retired number 41 Tom Seaver up high 3 and 0. Oh. Did you ever see a power pitcher with better mechanics better control or a better brain than Tom Seaver. Well, he would be at the top of the rank. He got the most votes anybody ever got percentage wise going into the Hall of Fame. Highest percentage of voters. Not all of them but almost. You know ironically Fran there was another pitcher on that staff who had great mechanics too. Jerry. Kuzma. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like the Babe Ruth Lou Gehrig syndrome. Jerry got lost because of Tom Seaver. Here's a 3 1 pitch. 
There's a strike three and two. Jerry was a very underrated pitcher. He you know was the hitters outstanding. Oh, well, the hitters had a lot of respect for him. Three two pitch. Foul out of play. So we'll do it again at three and two. Ordonia's batting 226. He's over one in his game. He flies to center field. Will he ever get the respect as a complete player if he doesn't hit? There have been shortstops that really haven't been impact hitters that have gotten a great deal of respect for the defense. Mark Moanger for one. Three and two on Ordonia's. How about that? He had a ball over his head and picked up a base hit. That's a free swinger, Ray Ordonez. He's got to be the freest swinger of any eighth hitter in baseball. Yeah, he is a Bible hitter. Thou shalt not pass. If you throw him anything <laughs> up in his eyes, he's going to swing at it. And this was right up in his eyes. It's over his head. And he lines it in the center field, so the Mets in a perfect position to sacrifice here with Reynoso. How about Bayergers yelling out there, Ordonez? <laughs> Hitting the ball over his head. That's not an easy feat, hitting a major league fastball over your head. Ordonez with a leadoff first. Armando Reynoso's the batter. They check Ordonez. He was allowed to hit away in a 3 0 count. I don't blame him. But you know what? You know what? He'd probably say, you better be a little bit more selective. <laughs> well, he'll take the base hit over the walk every time. He's also doing something he didn't do with the Mets in his rookie year. He's stealing bases. He has six out of eight so far this year. Well, Bobby Valentine has been very aggressive, putting runners in motion at any time. He also squares, bunts the ball up in the air. Burke loves it. Ordonez retreats to first. Burke pull a muscle. The way he's walking out there. Center fielder Carl Everett. Burke seems to be favoring that right leg. Looks a little like Jim Bunning. Bill Wise, he did something coming off that mound to get to that ball. There's no doubt about it. Taking a lot of time before getting back on top of the mound. And there's breaking the action. Ought to be a great time for the great taste of Bud Light. It's a big hit with fans everywhere because it won't fill you up. And it never lets you down, so make it a Bud Light. Burke is favoring that leg. He just checked Ordonez at first base. He's facing Carl Everett right now with one man out, bottom of the fifth inning. He just tuned in, stay with us. No score, the Rockies and the Mets. Five hits in this game for the Mets, none for the Rockies. Inside to Everett, 1 0. Oh. Boy, there's nothing like an afternoon game with that sun, huh? Sun drenched. This is the way they intended the game to be played in the afternoon on a sunny day. Just laid back and watch him play. There goes Ordonez. Ever protects him to throw to second. Not in time. It was a bad throw. And if you take a look at Everett, he got in the way of the catcher with that bat. He brought that bat back like he was going to bunt, put it out like he was going to bunt, brought it back. Good job by Everett protecting the runner, making. Reed, the catcher, come up to throw, and he threw it high. Good job. Very distracting. To Good the catcher. slide right here. Yeah. Even though it's a head first slide, he got the hands in on the bag ahead of the tag. Good job by Everett protecting the runner, making it tough on the catcher, keeping the catcher back. Yeah. That's an assist for the hitter, believe me. There's a foul ball on the right field line. One and two on Carl Everett. I'll tell you when you really hate it is when and Rod Carew could do this like nobody else. He would put the bat between the catcher's eyes and the ball and bring the bat right back towards the catcher. So not only are you you have to stay back, but you couldn't see the ball to the last second. One and two on Carl Everett. Ordonez leading off second base. And it was a curveball. Yeah, that, I mean, that's hard to believe. When you're behind in a curveball, there's, there's something going on that's not Bonzo. right. Look at this curveball, and he's got this in the catcher's glove before he even gets the bat through. Well, maybe he 
lost tonight. Could have. Well, two men are gone. Runner still in scoring position. Ray Ordonez and the batter, Edgardo Alfonso. First strikeout in the game by Burke. And it comes to the runner at second base. Here's a fastball for a strike. You can't say enough about Burke. This is his first major league start. The Rockies have used him out of the bullpen. He's looked good. Big Don Baylor. Couldn't hurt him. 0-1 pitch. Bonzo takes off high. One and one. Hit by more pitches than anybody that ever played the game. And one of the hardest sliders, if not the hardest clean slider into second base I've ever seen. When he would get hit by a pitch, he told me he would never charge, he never charged him out, and he's against his team, his, his players charging him out. One one pitch up high. Two and one. He told his players when you get hit by a pitch, go down to first base, and when the ball is hit on the ground, take out the second baseman. Do some damage to him. I said, I hope your second baseman's not in that meeting. Listen to that. Go get the second baseman after you get hit by a pitch. Don Baylor never charged him out. 2-1 pitch. Up high. 3 and 1. Both of the second basemen on the team resigned, I understand. <laughs> Don Baylor with over 300 home runs and over 2,000 hits. How many times was he hit with a pitch ball and never charged him out? 250 sometimes. How many times did you get hit? Not very often. You were a <laughs> no, I didn't <laughs> figure that was a way to get home runs. That's can't do that. Up high, so Alfonso walks. The Mets have runners on first and second for John Olerud. And how effective is John Olerud with scoring, with runners in scoring position? Well, he's leading the National League. As Frank Funk goes out to talk to John Burke. And batting. Jeffrey. He's batting. 538 with runners in scoring position. And how would you like to be a teammate of his? Todd Huntley's hitting 444 with runners in scoring position. He's not even close. First baseman, <laughs> John Olerud. Well, we talked about this acquisition, Olerud coming over to the New York Mets. Just an incredible move by Joe McElvain and the Mets getting Olerud to come over here and get the other team to pay his salary. And on top of it, they got a good fielding first baseman. Oh. He led the American League in fielding percentage last year. He's got great hands. He must have fell into somebody's doghouse because of his silence. Look at that average, 348. He's one for one. He's been hit by a pitch. He at bat right now for Olaru. Outside, 1-0. and oh. Is there anybody you'd rather have up on a mid ball club right now? Hey. Well, he is a good contact hitter, and that's what you like to see with runners in scoring position. Never over swings. At least so far this year, he hasn't over. He hasn't over swung at anything. That's not his style. He just puts that bat right on the ball and takes what he gets. Same thing in batting practice. I'm watching him today, just hitting line drives all over the field. And the 1-0 pitch is up and in. Two balls, no strikes on John Olerud. He's walked 19 times this year, one time intentionally. How about, I'll tell you a stat, I'm astounded at. The year he hit 363, walked intentionally 33 times, tying the record set by Ted Williams in the American League. 2 0 pitch. Inside, 3 0. Frank Funk said, I just went out and talked to him. Now keep in mind, John Burke has struggled with his control in the past. You see Todd Huntley on deck. So if he messes around with Olerud, he's not getting a slouch in Todd Hundley. No score, the Rockies in the Mets. Ball four. Four straight balls to Olerud, and the Mets have the bases jammed for Todd Hundley. And Don Baylor says this, this can't be happening again. Met Jerry DePoto starting to throw in a rocky bullpen. Pat Domino music in the background. This place is starting to jump. I like this music. Mets had five consecutive walks yesterday in the eighth inning. Three and four forced in runs. Pat <laughs> Domino saw I got walking. <laughs> you remember Pat, don't you? Sure do. Terrific. 
Well, Todd Hundley will bat with the bases loaded. Mets have had one home run this year with the bases loaded, and that's by Carl Everett. And they had no home runs with the bases loaded last year all season long. So the runners were Donius, Alfonso, and Olavu. Fastball misses inside, ball one. You know, it's funny, this is a situation where a pitcher is missed with five straight balls, but you want a guy like Todd Hundley to take advantage of a mistake pitch. And this is a time of a game when a pitcher will make a mistake, even with his fastball, trying to throw strikes. There's a long drive down the right field line. It'll drift into the crowd and out of play. Burt against Hundley. Todd Hundley 0 for 2 in today's game. As a home run hitter, Ralph, can you tend to over swing in a situation like Yeah, this? you got to keep yourself from doing that. Inside, two and one. What do you tell yourself as a home run hitter? I, I used to just go through mentally just a phrase like, just get the bat and the ball. Just hit it on the good part of the bat. Try not to swing 100%. I tried to stay about 80%. Two one pitch. Swung on and missed. Two balls and two strikes on Hundley. That was a good pitch right there. He got a breaking ball with a count in favor of the hitter. Two balls and one strike. And he gets it over. So he throws the curveball off speed pitch and Huntley goes after it. Two balls, two strikes, two outs. Bases are loaded with Mets. There's no score. We're in the bottom of the fifth inning. John Burke on the mound for the Rockies pitching to Todd Hundley. The Rockies have yet to get a hit in this game. Ooh. He thought he had him with a fastball on the inside part of the plate. But it's called ball three, so it's a full count on Hundley. Well, a big windup, and Ordonius, the runner at third, comes way down the line. That bothers the hitter. Hundley takes the pitch, and it's just off the plate. That really bothers the hitter. Especially a left-handed hitter. The crowd is alive. It's three and two on Hundley. Two outs. Swing and miss, and that's a key strikeout for John Burke. Good pitching by the Rocky right-hander. Mets three and three. We have no score. The Rockies and the Mets. I'm Cal Ripken, and this is my nightmare. I'm driving to the ballpark to make my 10,000th consecutive start when all of a sudden... Starting at third, number 65, Dan Bigelow. No! This is when I figure out this couldn't be happening because I use Fram filters, and you know how dependable they are. So I pinch myself and... Oh, what a play by Mr. Dependable! Fram filters, as dependable as the people who use them. Got to give the pitcher an awful lot of credit right here. Three balls, two strikes, bases loaded. The memory of yesterday where five consecutive walks were given to the Mets, and he throws a 3-2 curveball to Huntley and strikes him out. That is good pitching for the Colorado rookie, John Burke. And we go to the top of the sixth inning here at Shea. Quentin McCracken leads it off. He'll be followed by John Vanderwall and then Dante Bichette. Mondo Reynoso has yet to give up a hit to the Rockies. Fastball down low, ball one. No score, the Rockies and the Mets. That's strikeouts. Good way to change the atmosphere, isn't it? When uh, Burke struck out Hundley with the bases jammed. Hundley hasn't had a home run since May the 6th. But well, Ralph, as a home run hitter yourself, I know as a catcher, if a guy's red hot, I am going to try to pitch around him as much as I can. If you're a good home run hitter, I got to believe you tend to get anxious to produce. You don't want to be walking. Therefore, maybe you start swinging the bad balls. If not, you're walking a lot. You, you're not getting your rips. That was a knock on Ted Williams. He had such a good eye at the plate, and they said he should chase some balls and go after pitches when he needed a home run in the situation. And they used to say the module would do that. But if you got a way of hitting and it's your style and you're built in to taking pitches that are close and having a good eye, to change from that is a bad move. 
That is my opinion on that. Camacho was more of a out of the strike zone hitter than Ted Williams was. 2 2 pitch to McCracken. This is a bouncer to short. Ordonez. Double pumps over to all the route and one down. So right. it's one man down. The batter will be John Vanderwall, who's 0 for 2. He slid out and he grounded out. Absolutely gorgeous day here at Chase Stadium. After the game today, the Mets will travel to Florida to take on the Marlins Tuesday and Wednesday. They're off Thursday, and then they open up a three game set in Philadelphia. Following that, they'll go to Montreal for three. Rick Reed against Kevin Brown in tomorrow night's game. Pitches down low to Vanderwall, 1 0. We'll bring you all the action from Florida, both games. You can see it right here on Sports Channel. One-zero pitch to Vanderwall, fouls it back. One ball and one strike. Larry Walker not in the game today. Larry right, Walker working on winning the triple crown. It hasn't been done since 1937 when Joe Medwick did it, playing for the St. Louis Cardinals. Home run title, RBI title, and the batting title. One and two on Vanderwall. That's a nasty pitch right there. So far, Reynoso has made terrific pitches on the Rockies. He was a very popular member of the Rockies organization, but not popular enough to stay. Inside. When the Triple Crown in racing was won, it was 1937 that they first started calling it the Triple Crown. It was won by War Admiral. And there's a chance War Admiral will have his feet duplicated this year as the Triple Crown is up for grabs this year. Pulled to the right side, foul, so we'll do it again at 2 and 2. So in, fact, the year, in fact, the year War Admiral won the Triple Crown, did. Two guys won the triple crown, Jimmy Fox and um, Chuck, Klein. Chuck Klein. Was that the same year? I, I'm not sure of that. Bobby Valentine doesn't care about triple crowns, cares about victories. But but War like Admiral and Joe Medwick did it the same year. Of course, one's in baseball, the other was okay, in then that other sport. They got the term triple crown from horse racing. Right. Chuck Klein won it in 1933. There's a bouncer by Yerga. Olerud almost threw it away, but Olerud is six foot five and can stretch. I tell you, Bayerga's done a nice job at second Let base this year. That was a big vision. question mark about Bayerga was his defensive ability. Uh, he's done a good job defensively. Speaking of Chuck Klein, he is a player that played in a very small ballpark. He played in Baker Bowl, which had a very short right field fence. And he almost didn't get in the Hall of Fame because of that ballpark, such as Colorado players don't get all the acclaim they need because of the park being a mile high and balls traveling out of it. Dante Bichette chases a good breaking ball. 0-1 on the rocky left fielder. Here's a guy who was penalized for doing the job at Coors Field. Did Should not have won the MVP. Yeah. I don't think they're ever going to give it to a hitter in Coors Field. Outside, 1-1. One well, that short porch Baker Bowl in Philadelphia took a lot of credit away from Chuck Klein, who was an amazingly good hitter, left hand batter. First bat I ever bought, Louisville Slugger, was a Chuck Klein model. I broke it the first day I used it. It's amazing that in 33, Ralph, Klein and Fox both won. I mean, think about how tough it is to win a triple crown. They both won it the same year. Did both play in Philadelphia that year? One for the Phillies, one for the A's? But the Phillies didn't play in Baker Bowl. No, but I mean they were in Philadelphia. They two could and have been. Two and one. Bichette pulls it. Well, Fonzo. The stories are Mondo Reynoso. We've played five and a half here at Shea. No score. And the Rockies have yet to get a hit against the right-hander. New York Mets baseball on Sports Channel is brought to you in part by OmniPoint. 100% digital, 0% hassle. And by Toyota. I love what you do for me. Saturday, May 
31st is Sharp Electronics Cap Night. All fans 15 and over receive the Mets' new white game cap free. So call for seats and join us as the Mets take on the Phillies. Call 718-507-TIXX and get your Mets now. Well, back here at Shea Stadium, the Rockies and the Mets, if you just tuned in, stay with us. After five and a half, no score. Bob Apodaca talking to Armando Reynoso about mechanics, I'm sure. But so far, the Rockies have yet to get a hit against the right-hander. He's made some outstanding pitches today. I never thought I'd say this, but you're a genius oh. because Jimmy Fox, playing for the Philadelphia Athletics in the American League in 1933, won the Triple Crown. Chuck Klein, playing for the Philadelphia Phillies, won the Triple Crown in 1933. Fox with 48 home runs, 163 runs batted in, a 356 average. Klein had 28 home runs, 120 runs batted in, and a 368 average. Did you say genius? You are a genius. If you, if you can continue saying that throughout the course of this year, I'd appreciate that. <laughs> there it is, Rogers. How about Rogers Orange be a second baseman? He did it twice. Triple crown winners, Chuck Klein, Joe Medwick. Three out of the, those five were with, the, were with the Cardinals. In the American League, Ty Cobb, Jimmy Fox, Garrett Williams twice, Mantle, Robinson, Yastrzemski. 66, Robinson won it. In 67, he was leading in all three categories early in the year and was injured in a collision in second base. And I asked him, would you do it again? He said, no, I couldn't believe Frank Robinson said, no, there's Jerry Poe, the new pitcher. One and all in the year, one save, an earned run average over seven. Incidentally, the year Cobb won the home run crown with the triple crown, he had nine home runs. Yeah, but that was the dead ball era. They were throwing rocks. It was 1909. You were there. I was there. Husky was not. He's one for two in his game. He also has a stolen base. And the 0 1 pitch from Jimmy DePoto. He jams him, fouls it back 0 and 2. I know you Hall of Famers are happy about Pete Rose. You guys don't want him in the Hall of Fame because of the gambling. I can tell you one thing, Ralph. Ty Cobb's in there. Tris Speaker's in there. Were they involved in gambling? I have no idea. I have read that they were called in before the head man in the American League and talked to about something similar to that. Fouled back. We'll do it again at 0-2 on But it Husky. never went any farther. In fact, it was just a couple of days ago that uh, Detroit, uh, the anniversary of the strike of the Detroit players when Cobb was suspended. And the, and the Detroit went on and got the St. Joseph's College baseball That's team right. to play. And the pitcher for that Detroit team was uh, later on became a priest. <laughs> he gave up something like 24 runs and pitched the whole game. That'll drive you into the priesthood. One and two on Butch Husky. No, no score here in the bottom of the sixth inning. Inside, two and two. When I was growing up, I went to a Catholic school in Massachusetts, and the priests and the nuns encouraged people to play baseball. In fact, we had some nuns that could throw and hit. Two and two on Butch Husky. Husky's been on fire. Breaking ball way up high. Three balls and two strikes. Husky will be followed by Bayerga. How about the collision Friday night at home plate with Butch Husky? Kurt Manwaring got hammered by Husky. Here's a 3-2 pitch. Breaking ball is foul out of play. The way Husky came around third base Friday night, they, they tell the catcher to give some part of the plate to the runner. If I was catching, I'd have given him the whole thing. He would have been a bullfighter. No. Who lay? Yeah, huh? tried out been out his way. <laughs> Three and two on the big guy. Fastball threw it right by him. One down. And let's take a look at the Jeep Eagle mid-game recap. Armando Reynoso is the story. No hitter through six. 
John Olerud has reached base three times, and John Burke has also pitched an excellent ball game. Striking out Todd Hunley on a breaking ball with the bases loaded to end the bottom of the fifth. But that's the story right there. So far, Armando Reynoso. Ayerga takes outside, 1-0. Ayerga's 0 for 2 in this game. Rounded out and flied out. Look at that batting average. A month ago, <laughs> there was question marks about whether or not Bayerga could still do it. And everybody questioned it. Hits the ball hard, base hit in the right field. So Bayerga picking up his first hit of the game. And for the Mets, that's hit number six. Right fielder Alex Ochoa. <laughs> That'll be a great feeling for him to finally get off that deep slump. And the confidence should be returning. Doesn't come back that fast because you're never sure. And it's funny, he's going he's to start driving in runs now, and also he'll start hitting the long ball. He'll get more selective. That's one of the reasons why he'll hit the long ball. And he'll remember he could do it at one time. But every, I don't think there was a person who believed in Carlos Baerga in April. Well, certainly Bobby Valentine didn't. He put him on the bench. I know. Uh, I didn't think he could do it anymore. How about you? Well, I had never seen him play, but it didn't make any sense that he could have a 298 career batting average with an average close to 100 RBIs and not be a good hitter. But you had your job. He never showed anything here with the New York Mets, even when he came over yeah. last year. Alex Ochoa takes inside ball one. It's funny because he had an abdominal pull. I don't know if you ever had one of those things. They hurt. Yeah, but you know, after a while, when a guy doesn't hit and he's just sitting around, you, you start to have your doubts. Well, you can't hit if you're on the bench, and that's the one thing that was a real problem for the New York Mets because he's got a big contract, and he also has to be either re-signed again, and if he gets hitting, he's going to be a big factor for the New York Mets for some years if they can re-sign him. 1-0 pitch, one down and missed. One and one on Alex Ochoa, who you have your doubts about Alex Ochoa? Everybody does. And why is because he doesn't have good swings. That swing right there would emphasize the fact that that he's not, he hasn't got it going right. This is just a very bad swing. Well, lead him up right there. And the one-one pitch from DePoto, swung on and missed. One and two. Let's face it, Butch Husky had some swings in April, and you thought he belonged in A ball. He had some of the ugliest swings in baseball in April. He's been swinging the bat a lot better lately. He's so swinging with authority right now, and that's a sign of confidence. And if Husky continues to hit the ball as hard as he's been hitting it, the Mets are in good shape for this season and for many more. And, and you have Bayerga starting to hit the ball. The guy in left field, Bernard Gilkey, and need to get him untracked once he starts swinging the bat, driving in runs. You got Lance Jansen and with the shin splints. Bayerga leads off first. Fastball inside to Ochoa. Last year, Ochoa went five for five in Philadelphia. Hit for the cycle. And you felt, and everybody felt, sky's the limit. His uh, lifetime average off of last year, 295 in the major leagues. He had a fine rookie year. Went to spring training after a hard workout program during the offseason. Hit some long balls in spring training. The reason why that wasn't a balk, he broke contact with a pitching rubber. If you step off the rubber, you can do anything you want in the mound. And when you break contact with the rubber, you then become an infielder. If he threw the ball away into the stands, it'd be two bases rather than one. Foul off. For a pitcher to throw it away with his foot on the rubber, if he threw it in the stands trying to pick the runner on first, it'd be one base. One from the mound, two from the field of play. But once the pitcher breaks with the rubber, he becomes an infielder. And if he turns and throws the first and it goes into the stands, two bases. You're a world of information yes, here today. I picked that up. I picked it up driving to the ballpark today. I was reading in the traffic jam. <laughs> you read when there isn't a traffic jam. <laughs> There's a looper down the right field line. Foul ball. Well, 
Well, here again, it's not a good swing, just sort of a flail at it. And occurs in the foul territory. Sometimes when you break out of those batting slumps, you do it with a fluke base hit. Gives you that little extra spark, kind of gets a monkey off your back. Cho would like to get the monkey off his back right now. As we said, he's been struggling. But the story here at Chase Stadium so far is Armando Reynoso. The Rockies have yet to get a hit off the right-hander. Here's a 2-2 pitch. And the Pota is just eating Ochoa up on the inside part of the plate with fastball. Here's that pitch in tight, and look at the swing he puts on it. Mm. Inevitably, when you have a sinker ball pitcher in a game, somebody's going to foul the ball off their foot. Baerga with the lead off first. Breaking ball misses down low. Full count on Alex Ochoa. Runner on first base. Now you're the manager, Ralph. The ascendant. <laughs> well, you got a batter that's not hitting. You got a runner that's not fast. So you send but if you play hunches, <laughs> you send it. And Bobby Valentine is a hunts player. I'd like to go to the racetrack with him. <laughs> There goes Baerga. Ochoa lifts the ball left field. Base hit. They play the hunch. And it all works out for Bobby Valentine and the Mets. Shortstop Ray Ordonez. Well, the pitch. 3 2 pitch. Again, it's that sinking fastball. Ochoa puts a swing on it. Bayerga running with the pitch can go to second, and that's all with the play in front of Bayerga. He draws a throw back to second base from Bichette. So now the Mets have runners at first and second, and Ray Ordonez, the batter. Ray with a base hit his last time up. And the pitch was a 3 0 pitch. It was over his head, and he slapped it into center field for a base hit. He has a single and a stolen base. He's one for two. Mets with runners on first and second. Nobody, I should say, one out. No score. The Rockies and the Mets. Ayerga on second. Ochoa on first. Up high, ball one. If he keeps throwing Ochoa up there, he's going to hurt him. I should say Ordonez up there. Ordonez literally had a ball over his head his last time up. He loves that high fastball. He swings at it all the time. Armando Reynoso's on deck. And the 1 0 pitch. It's a strike. 1 and 1 on Ray Ordonez. There's Reynoso. He's yet to allow a rocky base hit in his ball game. Jeff Reed flashing signs to Jerry DePoto. Breaking ball misses down low. Two and one. Don Baylor. Probably still shell shocked from yesterday's game. Two one pitch. Three and one. How can Ordonez let that ball get by? That was over his head, too. Now you'll have, if he gets on, the base is loaded. I guess he'd take out Reynoso for a pinch hitter. <laughs> yeah, it's happened. <laughs> mm. Mentioned before, as you look at this pitch again, uh, the Padres have yet to have a no hitter pitch for them. The Mets are another team, and also the Rockies. But the Padres had a pitcher throwing a no hitter, Clay Kirby. Against the New York Mets, and they took him out in the ninth inning for a pinch hitter. <laughs> Preston Gomez was the manager. Here's the pitch. Up high. All four. All four bases loaded with Mets. Our 
Armando Reynoso with one home run this year is the batter. So DePoto against Reynoso. Nice hand for Armando Reynoso. Second time the Mets have had the bases loaded in this game. The last time, Todd Huntley was struck out on a 3-2 curveball. Now Reynoso the batter. He's had five hits and 12 at bats so far this year. One of those hits a home run. There you go Ochoa and Ordonez on the bases. One out. Reynoso takes the strike, so it's 0-1 on Armando Reynoso, who's one for two with a single in his game. It's interesting that Don Baylor has his shortstop and second baseman back for the double play here, with the pitcher hitting. First baseman, third baseman, even with the bag defensively. 0-1 on Reynoso, Carl Everett on deck. No score, no hits in his game for the Rockies. Seven hits for the Mets. Reynoso fouls it off. Two pitch outside one and two. Gary DePoto was a mystery pitching for the New York Mets. Everybody loved his stuff. That's a terrific sinker. Also features a slider. Let's try to get him to throw that sinker all the time. You see the runners on the bases. The Mets have the bases loaded. One two pitch. Swung out and missed strike three. So DePoto strikes out Reynoso. It'll bring to the plate Carl Everett. Frank Funk, the pitching coach with the Rockies, back out to talk to Jerry DePoto. They've got some clutch pitching today from their pitchers, John Burke and now Jerry DePoto. This Nothing but a fastball, and he blew him out of there. And now it's up to Carl Everett. Boto striking out a second batter in the inning. Center fielder Carl Darren Everett. Holmes now throwing in the Rockies bullpen. I'm sure Don Baylor sent Frank Funk out to talk about Carl Everett with Jerry DePoto. So if Jerry DePoto played with Carl Everett, he should know him. And Carl Everett should know Jerry DePoto. That's why you get to watch the game closely. Three home runs this year, two grand slams in his career for Carl Everett. Base is still loaded with Mets. Bayerga, Ochoa, and Ordonez on for Carl Everett. Hits the ball, hard base hit into right field. One run will score. Here comes Ochoa. The throw goes to third, and the Mets have two, two runs on the board. It's two zip New York. Good hitting by Carl Everett. Driving in two Mets, and it's now two zip New York. Well, Everett hitting here, and he gets a fastball from DePota and drills it through the infield for two runs batted in. Good base running all the way around. The throw by Vanderwall goes across to third base, missing the cutoff man. And Everett ends up at second base on the throw through the infield. So Everett doing a good job following up the base hit by going down to second on the overthrow. Armando Reynoso looking on. Rockies have yet to get a hit against the Met right-hander. 2-0, the Mets are on top of the Rockies. We're in the bottom of the sixth inning. Everett's on second. Ordonez is on third. Alfonso's the batter. He's 0 for 2 in his game. He's also walked. It's a chopper to short. Should be an easy play for Weiss and this. But the Mets pick up two runs here in the bottom of the sixth. Everett with the big hit. But the story here at Shea is that guy, Armando Reynoso. And 
we'll be back. Fans, catch your favorite players on Mets Inside Pitch with in-depth features, reports, and interviews. Mets Inside Pitch, Fridays at 5.30 on Sports Channel. Two-nothing, the Mets on top of the Rockies. That man's the story right now. We're going to the top of the seventh inning. The Rockies have yet to get a hit against Armando Reynoso, their former teammate. He'll pitch to Andres Galarraga, leading it off here in the seventh. And do you wonder, a hard-hitting team like the Rockies, did he no hitters against him last year? Two, Mr. Rose. That's right, Al Leiter of the Florida Marlins. And then Hideo Nomo. Marlins uh, doing it early in the season, and Nomo with the Dodgers in September. So Andres Galarraga takes upstairs for ball one. Where is he among our Chrysler League leaders? Right there in the slugging percentage category. Trust us, trust us. And the breaking ball, one and one. Trust us, I like it. <laughs> well, I thought we were trustworthy. Come on, put it up there. Where is it? There it is. There you go. We can see Larry Walker before this game's over. It's slider, one ball, two strikes. Yeah, remember, the Rockies have some no-hit busters on the bench. Larry Walker, Eric Young, Ellis Burks, all available to Don Baylor. There's Walker. Adjusting his denaturizer. Two and two. Outfield straight away as we start the seventh inning. Two to nothing, New York. And that's fouled off. Well, Reynoso has made outstanding pitches throughout this ball game. And that's his three. He's allowed three base on ball, struck out four in six innings. He's made some real good pitches when he had to. And Galarraga wants time. So will the King Corn curse rear its ugly head again? What is that, you ask? He'll tell you. Foul down the right field line by Galarraga. Ochoa giving chase, but he runs out of room. The first year of the Mets, 1962, a trading stamp company. Remember trading stamps, right? Glad stamps, green stamps, called King Corn guaranteed any Met pitcher who pitched a no-hit, no-run game, 50,000 trading stamps. But 35 years later, King Corn and trading stamps are long gone, and the Mets are still waiting for a no-hitter. Yeah. Nothing but air. Huntley will have to finish the play at first. One man out, strikeout number five for Reynoso. It's amazing how when you swing and miss and the catcher is unable to handle the ball cleanly, how long it Third takes a batter runner to get to first base. Now, uh, if Galarraga put this ball in play and had a shot at an infield hit, you'd have seen pretty decent speed. Well, watch this. Good pitch right here. Breaking ball. Hundley does a nice job blocking the ball. And Galarraga, take, Galarraga takes his time. Look at how much time it took for Hundley to pick it up, and he still threw Galarraga out by a whole lot. So here's Castilla. Nothing out of two. And yeah, that's on the outside corner. Probably face each other in the Mexican League. Well, Castilla and Reynoso spent some time in that league. Slider missed. One ball, one strike. Reynoso from Jalisco, Mexico. Breaking ball in the dirt. You love those, didn't you? You wince. I mean, you, you know it's funny in a game like this when, when the ball's in the dirt, you're, you're more keyed up because you, you know you get a shot at a, a well-picked ball game, possibly a no-hitter. So you're more keyed up. I'll tell you what, if a guy bounces a ball like that when it's 12-6, you go <laughs> nuts. Here's the 2-1. And the count even. Boy, he's been mixing up his pitches. He's got good ball movement on the fastball. He's been mixing it up with those breaking balls. Hey, how about this? It's either nerves or somebody's listening to music. <laughs> two balls, two strikes, one out. And Castillo wants time. You watch those legs in the ninth inning. If you're still no hitter going, they'll be real fast. 
And the 2-2. Just got a piece. Long throw by Ordonez. It's right there. Two men away. Well, this take the cake. This guy throws a no hitter. Got your Jeff Reed. But, and he's got good stuff. He's been a, a solid major league pitcher. But all the outstanding pitchers the Mets have had over the years. And, and say Armando Reynoso does it against his ex teammates. Well, a couple of things. Don't blame us for talking about it. Number one, we've got a job to do. Number two, you saw the 41 for Tom Seaver. He came close a few times back in the 60s and 70s. Nothing in one to Jeff Reed. But in 35 years, anyone with any superstitious notions would have been standing on his or her head or in some other variety of position so many times over the years to no avail that you got to throw that stuff out the window and approach it like an adult. No balls, two strikes to Reed. Renoso looks like he's nice to catch today. He can put the glove there and he's hitting the glove with the fastball and the breaking ball. And the, the no hitters on his mind. It's also on Todd Hummel's mind. And very much on the minds of the fans. Figure they could sell their sport cards for big bucks someday <laughs> if it holds up. <laughs> Below the knees, one and two. So you're into the memorabilia craze. No, you just have nah, to be man. enterprising. <laughs> <laughs> I was here in 69 when Seaver almost threw that perfect game against the Cubs. You were, you were ready to sell. <laughs> Here's the one, two to Reed. In the air, center field, pretty deep. Everett to the wall, but it's over the fence for a home run. The no-hitter's gone, the shutout's gone. It's now a two-to-one Met lead. And how about the nice hand for Armando Reynoso? Or is it for Jeff Reed? I think you were right the first time. That's right. So Jeff Reed with his third home run of the year. The no hitter is gone. And so for the 5,500 or and 74th regular season game in the history of the New York Mets, which is to say every one of them, they will not feature a Met no hitter. Got to be careful now and not let the game get out of hand. Yeah, some catchers will go out yeah. and talk to the pitcher. I'm not that big on meetings on the mound. I just I think that it would be a nice time to go out and just calm down the pitcher, get him to relax. I'm sure it's still on his mind. Not only losing the no-hitter, but he gave up a home run to lose it. One and one to Jason Bates. So now a two to one ball game. Remember, Reynoso had a three to nothing lead his last game here against Houston. The Astros came back to tie it up. The Mets would rally to win, but not for Reynoso, who took a no decision. In fact, Reynoso has had four no decisions in his previous six starts with the Mets. The other two have been wins. So the crowd deflated, but they paid to see a ball game. And the Mets with a one-run lead here in the seventh and two out. Inside, two and two. It is amazing how you deflate the crowd when something like that happens. Not only that, but your teammates. You've got to be careful of that. Here's the 2-2 to Bates. Got him. So Reynoso with a nice recovery. Comes right back to get Bates for his sixth strikeout, but he loses the no-hitter and the shutout, but not the support of his fans. He still has a 2-1 lead, and it's seventh inning stretch time at Shea. Well, we mentioned the crowd being somewhat deflated. They thought they might be in on Mets history. Armando Reynoso, no hits through six and two-thirds innings. And then Jeff Reed with Reynoso a strike away from getting out of the inning. Oh, Jeff Reed taking the ball down and away and hitting the ball a long way. It was a good pitch a from change. Reynoso. And Reed hit that ball over the left center field wall. Good hitting by the Rocky catcher and Reynoso watching it. He knew it had a chance. And that's a reaction to losing a no-hitter in the seventh inning. Well, again, he's got a game to worry about here with a one-run lead, and the Rockies 
making some changes as well. And Coors Light is celebrating 10 years in New York and New Jersey. Enjoy a Coors Light and the Mets baseball, a winning combination all season long. Changes for the Rockies. New pitcher is Darren Holmes as he throws strike one to John Olerud. He comes into the game as a double switch. He'll bat in the seventh spot. And batting in the ninth position of the batting order will be Eric Young. He takes over at second base for Jason Bates. So Young to second. And Darren Holmes on the mound. Lifted in the air to left. Lifting back to Shep. And there's one out. Funny, you watch Olerud in betting practice. He has the same stroke as he has in the, in a game. A lot of times, guys have different strokes in BP as opposed to a game. Hands come back Catcher very John little. Hubley. He's able to put that bat on a ball and drive. Look at Darren Holmes' stats. Yeah, he'd normally have been in a lot more games, but he spent some time on the disabled list with a right elbow strain. Also made an emergency start this year against the Braves. That was a course field, and he pitched well. Well, the only men not to reach base this game is that man right there, Todd Hundley. Well, he had a chance to do something in the fifth inning with the bases loaded, two out. But struck out. And the Mets broke through against Jerry DePoto for two in the sixth. Carl Everett driving in both runs with a single. And a 1-0 in the dirt. Cots had some frustrating at bats on this homestand. Four out of 18 in the six games here at Shane. A lot of balls that he's gotten under and popped up or hit to the warning track. Balls that he thought might have gone out. He's had some very kind of angry and animated walks back to the dugout. I think what happens is he was red hot and the pitcher started pitching around him so he would he was upset at walking, then he chased some balls out of the strike zone. And you know, as a major league player or any type of baseball player, you're gonna have your slumps, and he doesn't adjust well to his slumps like most players. They would one on Hundley. Reynoso did something that was last done by Bobby Jones in 1995. A Met pitcher taking a no-hitter into the seventh hey. inning. Sean Berry led off with a base hit to break up Bobby Jones bid Barry then of course with the Expos now the Houston Astros no trading stamps for a one hitter mm -hmm. or for that matter a no hitter when you allow a run Alaraga with those soft hands and there are two away well, if you'd like to see the Reader's Digest version of this game, tune in to Sports Left Channel Fielder, tonight Butch at 11. Huskies. Sports Channel, oh, I'm sorry, 6 o'clock tonight. <laughs> special <laughs> early edition of Sports Channel Life. So watch this whole thing in a half hour. Brought to you by Gatorade. Monte Bryant presiding over Sports Channel Life. So Reynoso pensive with a one run lead as Butch Husky comes up with two out and nobody on. Let's hit the road after the game going to Florida to play the Red Hot Marlins for two. They'll have those games for you from Florida on Sports Channel. Rick Reed and Kevin Brown tomorrow night. Mark Clark and Al Leiter on Wednesday. Inside and low, 2-0 to Butch. Must be really building his batting average over the last 10 games. 277 now. Almost 50 points higher than it was just two weeks ago. And that includes this game, making it 11. In the air, right center. Back to Vanderwall and McCracken, and it's Vanderwall running catch. So the Mets go in order. Seven in the books here at Shea. And it's still the New York Mets two, the Colorado Rockies one. Hmm. New York Mets baseball on Sports Channel is brought to you in part by Discover Card. 
proud partner of the Smithsonian's 150th anniversary. And by GHI, we put the care back in health care. Eighth inning on a summertime kind of afternoon at Shea Stadium. Gary Thurman will go in for Butch Husky and play left field in a defensive change by Bobby Valentine as Walt Weiss comes up. Lead off the Colorado eight. That's Alex Ochoa who has been in the ball game in right field. So it's Thurman Everett at Ochoa. Your Mets outfield left to right. And also had the no hitter with two outs in the seventh. Broken up by Jeff Reed's home run. Weiss nothing out of two. One ball one strike. Mentioned the Mets going to Florida to play the Marlins tomorrow. They're without Gary Sheffield with his thumb injury on the DL. And a foul bouncer outside first. Still one and two. Yet the Marlins have won seven in a row. Well, it's that hot and that sunny. That's different. You have one of those going for the graduation party That's this weekend? Absolutely. Walt Weiss called out on strikes. Seven strikeouts by Reynoso. Well, Reynoso has been extra fine with his pitches. He lost a no-hitter, a home run off the bat at Jeff Reed. But here's Second what he's been doing Eric all Young. afternoon. Look at that pitch. The only thing you can do if you're a hitter is hope it's called a ball. Now, there are the one-hitters in Mets history. One-hitter just doesn't make it. You know, you're, you're catching it or you're playing behind a pitch. One-hitter's nice. You say, it's a one-hitter. But a no-hitter, that's emotion. And it's never happened to a New York Mets starting pitcher. Well, they've never been emotional. <laughs> oh, they've been emotional, and there were the occasional puck marks in the outfield to prove it. And that's Greg McMichael getting ready in the bullpen, just in case. Two and nothing to Young. It's funny how it, it's an uplifting thing that no hitter to the whole team. Yet the, the one guy who's really experiencing the no hitter is the, the pitcher. Catcher likes to take a lot of credit for it, but it's insane. It was. He was responsible. He'd catch more than one in his career. <laughs> Saw Bobby Valentine. He was there for some of Nolan Ryan's no hitters in California. I'll tell you one thing. Talk about one hitter. Nolan Ryan, a bad night for him was against Kansas City, and he threw a one hitter. That was a bad night. He threw his glove out there. You ask Cookie Rojas, third base coach with the Vets. It was a Royal at the time that Fran was. The 3 0 to Young is outside and low. So Reynoso issues his fourth walk. You got to watch Eric Young with Center outstanding fielder, speed. He led the National in. League in stolen bases last year. He's got 10 this year. He's also been caught six times. But he also knows about this guy's move to first. And that's an intimidating factor that Reynoso has against his former teammates. And he will intimidate Don Baylor with that move. Baylor knows he has the best in the league. Well, he almost had Quentin McCracken in the third inning, but time was called to negate the pickoff and pitch count rising on Reynoso to 112. So Eric Young on first, sixth in the league with those 10 steals. McCracken 0 for 2 with a walk. And again, can't point out enough, Reynoso with his pickoffs. 30 since 1993. Mark Langston of the California Angels is the closest to him in that time span with 18. So here's the best pickoff move in the majors. Eric Young knows it. Short lead at first base. Now Alfonso on the grass at third. Deep at short and second for the double play. And it's hit hard by McCracken. Everett got a late start. He's got to play it on a hop, and it gets past him. On his way to third is Young. McCracken to second. The throw, not in time. Second and third, one man out. I believe the ball is misplayed by Carl Everett. Broke back on the ball, then came in. He's been fighting the sun all afternoon. You try to block the ball like a catcher and keep right the ball in front of him, and off to the right of Everett. Here's the ball hit off the end of the bat by McCracken. Never broke back. He comes in, then tries to block it, unable to do so. And a big break. He's lucky he got that ball to move over to his right after hitting his left arm. Strong throw to second base, but McCracken beats the tag. 
So now runners at second and third Vanderwall facing Reynoso the infield back for the time being. Will they move up on delivery or will the Mets give up the tying run and try and keep two runs from scoring on a hit through a drawn in infield Two, of course would put the Rockies in front. They score a double on the ball hit by McCracken. Infield does not move up in the pitch in the dirt. So they give McCracken a double, sending Young to third. The infield will give up the tying run. Outfield straight away on Vanderwall. In the dirt. And Reynoso may simply be running out of fuel. Bobby Valentine has action to both George McMichael throwing. Rockies have Bichette and Galarraga to follow Vanderwall in the batting order. And here comes Bobby Valentine. Not taking any chances. Valentine looking to the bullpen. Bobby Valentine doesn't make too many pitching changes. Usually Bob Apodaca will change the pitcher. Wanted to give McMichael as much time as possible to get ready. Well, Valentine keeps looking to the bullpen. 2 and 0 now on Vanderwall. And he's going to go to the bullpen. He, is, he feels that Reynoso is tiring, the key spot right now with runners on second and third. One man out, so Valentine goes to the bullpen. McMichael will come in this ball game in a crucial situation. No matter what, it's been an outstanding afternoon for Armando Reynoso, who took a no-hitter into the seventh, retired the first two. Jeff Reed broke it up with a home run to straightaway center. And now Reynoso will hope that the bullpen can get out of this mess. And the Mets can hold on to get Reynoso what would be his third win of the year. But that is in significant jeopardy right now as Bobby Valentine makes this call to the bullpen sponsored by Omnipoint. Greg McMichael coming into the ball game. And here's the ovation for Armando Reynoso. Tune in to Mets Inside Pitch on Sports Channel for in-depth features, reports, and interviews. Mets fans won't want to miss it. And catch a complete recap of the past week's games. Mets Inside Pitch, Fridays at 5.30 exclusively on Sports Channel. The hitting streaks, the homers, the shutouts, and the saves. Follow the best in baseball this season. Penn and Chase, Thursdays at 5.30 on Sports Channel. All Reynoso can do now is sit and hope, hope for help, in this case, from Greg McMichael, who comes on with runners at second and third, Young at third, McCracken at second, and one out, with the Mets holding the two-to-one lead. What an emotional escalator for Reynoso. Started off trying to hold on to a no-hit bid, gave it up with one swing in the bat, and the Rockies back in the ballgame. Those losses came against Houston in a one nothing game and Colorado here in a two to one game suffered by McMichael infield back and the 2 0 breaks outside and high with Dante Bichette waiting on deck. So it's Eric Young at third and Quentin McCracken at second outstanding speed on the bases for the Rockies. Breaking ball, ball four, and the bases are loaded with one out for Dante Bichette. Charge the walk to Armando Reynoso. So now the pacing and the foot tapping continues in the Met dugout. Here's one of the most productive hitters in the Rocky Ball Club as far as RBIs are concerned, Dante Bichette. Michaels handled him well. Two out of ten against Greg McMichael. Infield back looking for two. And a bouncer foul. 
The shed in this game is fly to center, struck out, grounded to third. And remember, the Mets have turned 46 double plays this year, right among the league leaders, tied with Montreal. Rockies and Pittsburgh with one more, 47. Florida with 50. Nothing in one to Bichette. Infield deep all around. Can they turn it? They come home to get the one. Alfonso playing it safe and properly slow on a slow hit ball gets the out of the plate. That's a heads up play by Alfonso. Some third baseman would go around the horn, but Alfonso going to the plate with a strong throw. First baseman, Andres Galarraga. Heads up play by Alfonso. Here's the shed getting jammed by Greg McMichael. Only one play. They could have gotten a force at second, but they need the force at home. So now two out and Galarraga the better. Galarraga 0 for 3. He struck out twice. And McMichael has also handled Galarraga well. Coming into this series, Galarraga just 1 for 10 against McMichael, but is that the great equalizer? Smokes with the bases loaded, but uh, Galarraga and a guy like Bichette, good fastball hitters, Castilla and McMichael doesn't throw hard. He would give guys like Galarraga and Bichette and Castilla a problem. See that stat. McMichael changes off a changeup. Bracket at third, Vanderwall at second, Bichette at first. Two men out, two to one New York in the eighth. One ball, one strike to Galarraga. Good ball moving right there. You saw Galarraga swing right over the pitch as it was sinking. He sees it, he sees it, he starts to swing, and boom, ball drops. Outfield deep and straight away also. Your hard hitters, your home run hitters, are they like that hard stuff, good hard fastballs. One ball, two strikes. Another change by McMichael. It is amazing. I mean, the harder you throw, the, the, the better the hitters like the major league hitters. You get a guy like McMichael, the guy that would get, the, the hitters that would give him a problem are the guys, the single hitters. Some of the fans standing at Shea, hoping McMichael can get out of it. One and two. Reynoso sitting, but hoping even more than the fans. Rick for a base hit to left. The tying run scores. Around third, here comes the throw to the plate. Gets past Hundley. The Rockies take the lead. Everybody moves up. The shot to third, Galarraga at second. It's three to two, Colorado. Third baseman, Vinny Castillo. Oh, McMichael was in front of Hunley rather than behind him. Galarraga, good hitting, goes out, gets a pitch that he swung and missed at the first two. Here's the throw, and Thurman's throw is a short hop to Hunley. Ball gets past him. You see McMichael was not behind Hunley to back him up. And the runners advance. So runners at second and third now, a three to two Colorado lead. How about that? Reynoso's on the losing end of this game, and Half hour ago, he was flirting with a no-hitter. Castilla hit hard to left. Thurman got it, and the side retired, but not before. The Rockies take the lead. Two out single by Galarraga. Reynoso now stands to lose. Well, Greg McMichael was one pitch Fran away from getting out of it with a two-to-one lead. Then Andres Galarraga ripped one to left for a two-run single and moved up on the error by Hundley. Good hitting by Galarraga. We showed the statistic where McMichael just dominated Galarraga so far in his career. But we also showed you an interesting statistic that Galarraga's tough with the bases loaded. He remains a very tough. It was good hitting by Galarraga. Good clutch hitting. And McMichael sitting in that Met Dugga. But how about Armando Reynoso? Talk about an emotional elevator. Well, right now that elevator's in the basement. 
Ellis Burks is in left field as he comes off the bench along with Larry Walker who goes into play right field. Rockies leading by a run as we go to the last of the eighth inning. So Don Baylor although giving his key players a rest and Burks has been slowed by a groin problem as well. Getting into the game for defense. So now Bobby Valentine's Mets have to come from behind. Baerga, Ochoa, and Ordonez. The hitters for New York against Darren Holmes here in the eighth inning. The crowd's only been 14,000 and change here today, but they've been especially enthusiastic. Mm -hmm. A lot of them thinking they might be in on some Mets history with Reynoso flirting with that no hitter. And a strike on the outside corner to Baerga, who's one for three. Hmm. Darren Holmes starting his second inning of work. Spy Cam catches him. Brought to you by Chase. Little chopper, Young. Takes care of by Erga, one away. Nice play by Young to get to that ball before it hit the ground again. Hits the right if it hits the ground Alex again, by Erga has an infield hit. It was the old Baltimore chop. Watch this. Boom. There's the Baltimore chop. Young coming in. He has to make this play. He cannot let that ball bounce again. So now with one out, Alex Ochoa singled and scored. Scoring on Everett's two-run base hit. Back in the sixth inning. Mets have had chance after chance this afternoon. They've left 12 men on. So check that nine men on. As they bat here in the eighth inning. One and one to Ochoa. Let's have Matt Franco out on deck to bat for Ray Ordonez. One and two to Ochoa. Don Baylor hoping that. The Rocky pitching can provide law and order in this eighth inning. He's seen a couple of nightmarish eighth innings on this road trip. Nine run eighth inning in Pittsburgh last week. Eight runs in the eighth yesterday. And in both of those games, Rocky pitchers totaled 12 bases on balls. Frank Funk wanting it to get straightened out as badly, if not more so, than Baylor. Mm -hmm. That's the first guy to go to in the pitching collapse. have had eight runners in scoring position against Rocky pitching today but scored only one of them. Well two of them actually. And Ochoa with a chopper and he's thrown out by Weiss two away. They've delivered once in those eight situations. The Rocky's got some good pitching today. John Burke who started the ball game pitched very well. Struck out Todd Hunley in the key situation with the bases loaded 3 2 breaking ball. Matt Franco. That scored both runs off of Jerry DePoto, the former Met. And now Matt Franco will be the pinch hitter for Ordonez. Glenn Turtle moving the outfielders around. Foul back, nothing and one. Clint's the new batting instructor with the Rockies. They've been through a few batting instructors. Ken Griffin was the batting instructor last year. He left the Rockies because he wanted a two year contract. The Rockies wouldn't give it to him, but the Reds would. Plus, he's a good friend of Ray Knight. Franco hits one in the air to left field. Pretty deep. And it can't be handled by Burks. McCracken plays it back in. And Franco's got a double. And remember, we've told you about Burks being bothered by that sore leg. <laughs> Like it had enough hang time for yeah. Burks to get to, didn't it? Looked like he was struggling with the fly ball, not his leg. But here's a pinch runner for Matt Franco. Manny Alexander going in to run. Here's Matt Franco to get his hitting lessons from Kurt Russell. Pretty good pitch. He hits that ball a long way. Burks pursuing it and unable to come up with it. Maybe it was a yeah, it was a leg. You see the way he's limping after he missed that ball. Oh, they're all going to limp after they miss it. That's true. <laughs> I had to limp down to perfection. So 
Franco gives the Mets the tying runner in scoring position. Danny Alexander runs for Franco, and Bernard Gilkey will be the pinch hitter for McMichael. Gilkey getting only his second official day off of the year. The other three games among the five that he's missed came when he left the Mets to attend the funeral of his grandfather. This could be a real big at bat for Bernard Gilkey. Forget the game. If he could get a hit in this situation, get himself on the right track. He has homered twice in 12 at bats against Darren Holmes. And he takes outside for a ball. Rockies taking that 3 2 lead with two in the eighth inning on a two out bases loaded single by Galarraga. That's trailing three to two. The Mets have nine hits, and the Rockies with only three hits and those three runs. Outside, 2 0. Oh. Carl Everett on deck. Everett two for four this afternoon, delivering both Met runs. That sixth inning single. Outfield, a step towards left on Gilkey. Infield deep, two balls, no strikes, two out. Alexander on second. And that's right there, it's two and one. Just three out of 17 during this homestand. Dreisfeld goes a lot deeper than that. In the air to right, Larry Walker waits. And the side retired. So the Mets threatened with a two out double by Matt Franco, but at the end of eight here at Shea, the Rockies have a three to two lead. We are at the home stretch brought to you by New York Racing, the most exciting ride in sports. Well, as we go to the ninth inning, the Mets with a couple more changes. At shortstop is Manny Alexander. Remember, he ran for Franco after Franco had the pitch double, batting in Ordonez's slot. And the new pitcher for New York will be Corey Lytle, who pitched an inning yesterday, scoreless inning, against the Rockies. Corey Lytle making his fourth appearance. That one win came in St. Louis last week, a game in which Carl Everett and Butch Husky had the back-to-back -back pinch hit homers to beat Dennis Eckersley. The Lytle will try to keep it right where it is. Rockies three, Mets two. Jeff Reed had the home run that spoiled Armando Reynoso's no-hit bid in the seventh inning with two out. And he takes downstairs for a ball. Rockies have the pitcher spot due up next, but Darnell Coles is on deck as a pinch hitter. Two and nothing on Jeff Reed. And that's below the knees. Scott Corey Lytle from the Milwaukee organization for catcher Kelly Stinnett. And Lytle has thrown four straight out of the strike zone to start the night. So now Darnell Coles will be the pinch hitter for Darren Holmes. Pinch hitting for Darren Holmes, number 28, Darnell Coles. Bob Apodaca had Corey Lytle last year down at Norfolk. Well, that always helps when you pitch for a manager or you play for a manager in the minor leagues and you do relatively well. When he gets up to the major leagues, there's a good chance he's going to call you up if he has confidence in you as a pitcher or as an everyday player. Happened to Matt Franco. It's happened to Alberto Castillo. Mm -hmm. and Ricky Trilicek gave up a home run yesterday to Galarraga in the ballgame. By Alexander, they don't get the force, but they do get the out at first. There's no way they should be able to get that out at first base. Not when the runner's that close to second base. No way by Erga could get that ball to first base. Alexander made a Shortstop fine play, White. throwing across his body. 
Watch this. This ball is hit hard. Outstanding play by Alexander, flipping to Bayerga. And Bayerga is able to get the runner at first base. Shouldn't shouldn't happen. Not if a runner is as close to Bayerga. Watch this. Right there, that double play is the order that. No way Bayerga should be able to get the ball at first. So that's Reed at second and Walt Weiss the batter. What a play by Alexander, but once Bayerga gets the ball, I'm surprised Bayerga was able to make the throw with Reed. Reed was sliding into the base. Great, he put it in the books as a double play. Now it simply moves a runner along. But even if, even if uh, the, the throw goes to second base, you still, you still can't get the throw to first base, not with the runner on top of you like that. Reed's going to take Bayerga out. One ball, one strike on Weiss. Mentioned Rick Trilicek warming up for the Mets bullpen. The home run he gave up yesterday was to Castilla, not Galarraga. Here's Trilicek. That's getting him last week from the Red Sox for Toby Borland. Bayerga takes the slow roller, retires Weiss. Pretty big turn at third by Reed. But now two men away. Second baseman Eric Young. And Eric Young. We'll see what he can do about getting Reed home with an insurance run. You know how you're talking about hard slides in the second base. I remember Willie Randolph a few years ago. Imagine the second base saying this. A second baseman saying this to anybody. He said runners don't slide as hard as they used to. When he first broke in. Of course, he played against McCray and Brett and Don Baylor. He said runners just don't slide and take you out as hard as they used to do it. How do you figure that? I don't know. I don't know what it is. Eric Young lifts the first pitch to center. And Carl Everett puts it away, and now the Mets will go to work. See if they can come back. No runs, no hits, a walk, one left. Last licks for the Mets. They're down a run. There's another kid that I, I've i seen grow up, uh, mature from a young, young player into a, a great player. Uh, I think he's going to... His best years are ahead of him. Uh, he's probably going to be uh, uh, the team leader on the field. Uh, they haven't had someone like that since Keith Hernandez. He's the core and the backbone of the team. Helps keep keep everybody fired up and keep everybody in line. He's awesome. All right, Mets will have the top of the order up in the ninth inning. See what they can do about getting even. Down by a run, but perhaps the Rockies would still be hitting if not for some questionable play on the bases. Yeah, now watch the runner, Jeff Reed, going into second base. All he used to do is make, well, he did, his, his leg did touch by Erica, but he could have taken him out with a harder slide. He, the biggest thing is he couldn't slide through the base or off the base because Bayerga could tag him. So it was either Jeff Reed took it easy on Bayerga, but it was a lot of guts on Bayerga's part to throw the ball. They say an infielder has to know the speed of the runner. He has to know the play. Is the runner moving? You figure if the runner's in motion, you're not going to get a play at first base. Bayerga still was able to make the throw to first base. So a fine play by Bayerga. Reed really couldn't slide through the base and take him out, but maybe a little bit harder contact. Jeff McCurry, the new pitcher for the Rockies. And this is interesting because usually their closer is Bruce Ruffin. Now, he pitched yesterday and walked three. Face three batters, walked them all through 14 pitches. And so Jeff McCurry, who pitched two-thirds of an inning and escaped unscathed yesterday, is the choice of Don Baylor. And as we said, a small crowd, only 14,000 and change here at Shea. Be noisy. Said, but yeah, they're making a lot of noise. Mm. And it'll be Everett, Alfonso, and Olaru to try and get something done. Mets trailing by a run, although Everett's single had given them a 2 to nothing lead in the sixth inning. Inside to Everett. Carl, usually a better hitter from the left side, has struggled this year against right-handed pitching, but he does have two for four today. And he takes a strike. One and one. It looked like he was up there and he was going to take a strike. Probably Bobby Valentine told him to take a strike. Make him work. Now it's 
two and one on Everett. The problem with a guy like Everett taking the strike is he's a much better hitter when he can hit that fastball. Got one from Dennis Eckersley last week in St. Louis that was left out over the plate and brought the Mets from behind. And he hits that one in the air to center. The Kraken's got it lined up. And there's one out. Third baseman Edgardo Alfonso. So perhaps McCurry forging a new role for himself. With the Pittsburgh Pirates and the Detroit Tigers. Rockies got him in the Rule 5 draft last December from Detroit. Taylor looking a little more relaxed did with a one run lead of the ninth. So here's Alfonso and the fastball inside nine. That fastball for a strike one and one. Alfonso has his average at 286. And that's down with that 0 for 3 today. Two and one to Alfonso as it was to Everett. Rockies will leave here and fly all the way to San Francisco. Play the Giants tomorrow night at Candlestick. Mets will be in Miami to face the Marlins. We'll have that for you on Sports Channel. On the outside corner, good pitch by McCurry. The count even two and two. That's winners of six of their last eight trying to creep three over the 500 mark for the first time. You see that he's been a good late inning hitter. And now the count full with Olerud on deck. Hey, you're getting into your, the middle of your order where the money men are. Hundley behind Olerud in the batting order. And nothing doing in the Rockies' bullpen. So it's Jeff McCurry's job right now to nail it shut. As Olerud gets ready, here's the payoff pitch to Alfonso. And that's it towards the gap and left center. McCracken coming over, and he can't get it. It deflects off his glove. Alfonso around second, but he's going to play it safe. And the tying run is in scoring position with one man out. A good base running by Alfonso holding on at second base. There was a temptation there to try for three. Well, Alfonso hits the ball hard into the gap in left center field. McCracken going over, fighting the sun. The ball hits off the end of the glove. And Alfonso heading around second base and holds on. Well, you know, one school of thought is with one out, you get to third base, you could score on and out. But right here, you've got Olerud and then Hundley up next, so you can understand Alfonso playing it safe. It would have been close to third base. You don't need a close play right now when you're trailing by one run in the ninth. And you get thrown out with Olerud and Hundley, and you've got a lot of questions to answer. situation and the Mets have won the ball game and the ball club went nuts at home plate waiting for John Olerud to tag them all somewhere either in that dugout or in the Mets locker room Armando Reynoso is doing a dance of relief because that was a ball game he did not deserve to lose but he stood to lose it until Olerud delivered 
off of Jeff McCurry, who you might say was auditioning for the closer role with Colorado. Rough and ineffective yesterday. It was Reed's homer that broke up the no-hitter. And John Olerud, you know, he's not here for his power, although they tried to make him into more of a home run hitter in Toronto, but right there, he turns, and the Mets win. Well, I'll tell you, what a sweet swing this guy's got. And a big win for the Mets. They go on the road after a come-from-behind victory here at Shea, and they are playing good baseball. What? Armando Reynoso for six or seven innings was the story here. The Mets fell behind, but a two-run home run here in the bottom of the ninth, and the Mets are victorious. Four to three, Mets, your final. Olerud, the hero, and take one more look at how the Mets sent everyone home. Olerud's seventh home run of the year. It's a game winner. We'll be back. And so the New York Mets have just completed a successful and, in this case, dramatic homestand as the Mets win for the fourth time in the six games. And they were partying after John Olerud hit the game-winning two-run homer. Well, I'll tell you one thing. This ball club was wild when Olerud hit that fastball over the right field wall. Look at this group waiting for Olerud to touch them all. And that's about as animated as you can see. John Olerud, a big home run. And once again, driving a fastball over the wall in a clutch situation. Might have noticed uh, Curry Lytle, number 11 there. He ends up the winning pitcher for the second time in a little more than a week as the Mets come from behind because of the home run ball. We were talking about the game in St. Louis when they beat Eckersley with two pinch homers. Now Olerud gives Lytle another win. But Olerud really something else. You get that ball down on Olerud, he slaps the ball around. You make good pitchers pitches. They'll slap it in the left field, slap it in the right field. And for some reason, I talked to him about this, when they get that ball up and he feels that the, the rule is in baseball, don't pitch those left-handers down. But for some reason, he's comfortable when they bring that ball up and he drives that ball. He's unusual. All right, John Olerud is downstairs. He'll join us when we get back. We'll talk about his game-winning home run as Olerud and the Mets have defeated the Colorado Rockies 4-3. to three. Stay tuned. Mets win it 4-3. to three. The reason they won it is waiting for us downstairs. This was the scene just about five or so <laughs> minutes ago after John Olerud hit the two-run home run off of uh, Jeff McCurry to win it. And John joins us from our studios here at Shea Stadium. John, every time you ask somebody in your situation here, what were they trying to do in the situation that uh, you found yourself in? They all basically say the same thing. They're just trying to hit it hard someplace. You had the tying run in scoring position. At any point in your mind, were you thinking about trying to take McCurry over the wall? No, definitely not. You know, I, I think uh, last couple games I've been getting myself in trouble uh, kind of jumping after balls, trying to put a little extra uh, into my swing. And, uh, you know, I think uh, last couple days I've just been concentrating on keeping my weight back, staying back, and, um, you know, John, driving the ball up the middle. John, uh, during the course of the ball game, Armando Reynoso was a story for about six innings, had a no-hitter going as an everyday player when you're on the field, do you get caught up in the emotion of that? Yeah, I think so. I think definitely. You look up there, you see he's got a no-hitter going late into the ball game, and, and uh, I think you're thinking, you know, any ball hit close to me, I'm going for it and I'm diving for it. You know, you want to you wanna keep that thing going. What about on the bench? I mean, are there any wise guys who walked up to Reynoso and said, hey, you got a no-hitter going? Or is it still <laughs> that same old superstition that players subscribe to where you just don't talk about it? I think it's the same superstition. You just don't talk about it. At least if there were guys uh, joking around like that, I didn't hear it. Now, does it, does it deflate the ball club when he, when he gave up not only the first hit, but a home run, putting the Rockies back into the ball game? Well, I think it, uh, you know, you get the home run, it, it takes away the no-hitter, it takes away the shutout. It, it uh, takes a little something out of you, but you just got to focus on, you know, getting the next guys out. you still got a one-run lead, and so I uh, got some big at-bats coming up. All right, we're going to show you the home run here, and I know you're probably um, waiting to talk about it and crow about specifics. Let's talk specifically first about the pitch. Well, it was a fastball, and uh, I'm just trying to keep my hands inside it, drive through it, and uh, I got it a little bit off the end of the bat. Um, I wasn't sure if it was going to go out or not, but uh, I just got enough of it. 
And we'll show you the swing one more time. Pretty consistent with what you've tried to do against right-handers? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm just uh, last, you know, last few days been really concentrating on keeping my weight back, not having as much lateral movement forward into the ball. John, one of the things I've noticed uh, since you joined the Mets is you rarely overswing. That's unusual for a major league hitter. Why? I don't know. I think that's something that uh, I've always done uh, ever since I've been in Little League. You know, coming up, people have always said, you know, you got to take a bigger swing or you, you don't look like you're really attacking it. Um, but uh, that's just the way my swing's always been. And I, I think I do it sometimes, get a little tentative up there and, and don't take as good as hard, aggressive swings as I should. Um, so that, that's sometimes a weakness of mine. John, you've seen this club evolve since spring training. What's going on here specifically? I mean, what's the ceiling for this club? Well, I don't know. I, I think, uh, you know, we've had uh, a lot of uh, key guys go down for us, uh, you know, and uh, some strange things happen over here, but uh, we've got a talented group of young guys. Pitching staff has really done a great job. I think you got to give them a lot of credit for uh, the way we've been playing lately because we've been in just about every ball game and uh, we haven't been scoring a ton of runs but uh... you know when you're in a game you know every at bat's a big at bat keeps the guys in the ball game so uh, i think the pitching staff's done a great job for us so far all right john congratulations thanks for joining us all right thanks that is john olerud our nissan star of the game he had the game winning home run in the ninth inning off of jeff mccurry to give the mets a four to three win and for appearing as our guest John receives dinner for two at the Mid-City Grill at 575 Fifth Avenue, conveniently located in Midtown on 47th Street. The Mid-City Grill features creative American cuisine and fine wine. Nothing to whine about for the Mets this afternoon. All smiles, thanks to Olerud. We'll have more after this. New York Mets Baseball on Sports Channel has been brought to you by your Tri-State GMC dealers. By Nobody Beats the Whiz. For state-of-the-art home electronics, computers, cameras, music, movies, and more, Nobody Beats the Whiz. By the Coors Light Wide Mouth Cam. Tap the Rockies with a smoother pour. And by your New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut Nissan dealers, who remind you that life is a journey. Enjoy the ride. Well, it was pretty noisy here just about 10 minutes or so ago when John Olerud hit one over Larry Walker's head over the right field fence to give the Mets a 4-3 to three win. And so now uh, we look ahead to Florida with the Red Hot Marlins. Mets will be in Miami 4-2 beginning tomorrow. Well, they're heading down there on a positive note. If you got a shot at uh, taking a look at the uh, New York Met Ball Club as they were coming out of the dugout to greet John Olerud, it was a wild scene here at Shea Stadium. So if you're going to go down to Florida to play those Marlins, this is a terrific note to leave on. And don't forget, the consistent hallmark of this team for the most part this season, and you have to qualify it with the most part because of the slow start, has been solid starting pitching. And even Reynoso, or even though he didn't figure in the final decision, and he was thankful for that because he stood to take the loss going into the ninth inning. You know, Reynoso, again, outstanding job today, and the starters do their job. Oh, he really did a, an outstanding job for the New York Mets. And, and keep in mind, Bernard Gilkey is yet to get going. Once he gets going... No telling about this ball club. All right, so the Mets win it 4-3. to three. They take three out of four from the Colorado Rockies. We're going to send you downstairs. Matt Lachlan is standing by to carry you through the rest of the Sports Authority game time. Fran and I will see you tomorrow night from Miami. All right, Howie, thank you very much. And as you mentioned, the 14,000 on hand made with a big noise when Olerud's home run sailed over the right field wall. But I don't know if it was as noisy in Shea, it was in, as it was inside the Mets clubhouse. A lot of high fives, a lot of bat packing, back packing, if you will, uh, padding, I should say, going on. Anyway, it was an exciting moment in the clubhouse. The team fired up by this come from behind victory as they end the homestand with the win over Colorado by a score of four to three. Todd Hunley, the only Met who did not reach base today, but nonetheless, he was able to share in the excitement of Olerud's homer. Oh man, this is uh, a long day out there, hot, and uh, John come up there in that situation and see that ball go over the fence, uh, happiest time of the year so far for me. Well, they just killed the music for a moment there, but this locker room is pumped. Uh, there's a big turnaround here, isn't there? Oh yeah, it's, uh, it's fun to come in. Um, we have confidence in each other, we pull for each other, 
And, uh, you know, we had a good feeling about uh, Owen at a bat. We knew he was going to come up there and uh, hit a ball hard, and especially Fonzie, I think, was the biggest uh, hit of the game right there, was to get on and, and give Old Root a chance to, uh, you know, pop one out, which he did. And, uh, you know, he just got the sweetest swing in baseball right now. The nice thing about it, aside from the win, is that Armando pitched brilliantly today, and it looked like he wasn't going to get a decision. He still doesn't get the decision, but at least the Mets come away with the win. I really, uh, today, Matt, two pitches that uh, kind of second-guess yourself on. And uh, one read hit out of the ballpark is backdoor curveball. And uh, pitch to uh, Galarraga uh, for McMichael. You know, you, you try and get him uh, through two good change-ups that were dropped off the table. And then the one kind of just uh, slipped out of his hand, and uh, Galarraga took advantage of it. Well, Reynoso's effort does not go unrewarded, as I mentioned in the interview with Todd. He does not get the decision, but at least the Mets come up with the victory after Reynoso's six and two-third innings of no-hit ball. The Mets with the win this afternoon. We'll have more on the Sports Authority post-game show as the Mets celebrate John Olerud's game-winning homer. The Mets move three games over 500 at 23 and 20. The Coors Light play of the game. The home run in the ninth inning by John Olerud, who went two for three this afternoon with two runs batted in. Also reached via hit batter and a walk. Olerud's seventh homer of the season gives the Mets the victory. And look at Butch Husky celebrate. This club is fired up after such a terrible start at 1.3 and nine on the season. A lot of people were saying this is the same old Mets, a dead club, and the season was only 12 games old, but they've turned things around. They're now 23 and 20. They embark on a nine game in nine day road trip. Tomorrow they'll take on Florida in the first of two. The road trip continues in Philadelphia and then wraps up in Montreal. But a different Mets club than what we saw at the beginning of the season, a confident club. And John Olerud adding to that confidence as he comes up with his seventh of the season in the ninth inning and the Mets beat Colorado. Corey Lytle gets the victory. He's now 2-0. Jeff McCurry suffers the loss. His record falls to 1-1. Edgardo Alfonso in the ninth inning had a one-out double to keep the Mets' hopes alive. After the game, I had a chance to talk to Fonzie about the ball game. Yeah, this, uh, this is uh, what I was thinking when I hit the ball. I, I, I know it was between a uh, left and a field. And then, you know, I...